Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am talking with John Douglas McCready. John is a philosopher. He's his PhD in philosophy. He's a professor of philosophy at Collin College in Plano, Texas. And he teaches many courses there on philosophy, ethics, logic, philosophy of religion, and along with social and political philosophy. He is the author of two books, including the most recent book, A Continental Guide to Philosophy. Um, That's what we mostly talk about in this conversation. We talk about a few other finer points, but we uh, talk about this book, which uh, was just released. And as we say in the conversation, um, I, I think I said in the beginning, many people want to find a kind of good introduction that's, you know, accessible but condensed, uh, but doesn't water down the principles with philosophy. Many people, when they want to read philosophy or get into it, it's an overwhelming task. There's just so many people. It's so dense. Where do you start? And, you know, I would highly recommend this book as a good entry point. Um, He basically, you know, takes six philosophers at different points with three main questions and really breaks down their their philosophy in in understandable, uh, but very, uh, I would say, uh, good ways of understanding their philosophy. It's not just like a cliff notes uh, idea. It's, it's, um, it's detailed in a, in a very, very good way. And so it's, it's fabulous. Um, and that's mostly what we, what we talk about. This conversation is, uh, very long. Um, this conversation is, uh, on the better half of three hours and closing on four actually. So, um, it was, it was a lot of fun. We, we had agreed to do a long one for, before we started. And so, um, we said, we'll do at least three and we'll see where it goes. And so it, it turns out that it was almost closer to four, uh, which I, I just can't, uh, thank him enough for his time and energy and stamina. Uh, I'm already always ready to do that with guests. And, uh, <laughs> most guests are, are, are just so, um, wonderful to, to give me their time that way. So he was, he was very generous. We start by talking about what is continental and analytic philosophy and those differences. This is something that, again, we we mentioned in the conversation, but, you know, if you ask, you know, 10 people, you're going to get 10 different answers. And many times people can't, uh, it's hard to kind of tie down a a, a kind of two sentence definition of continental and analytic philosophy. And so we talk about that and he gives a very nice definition of both and and why there's some kind of... um, rivalry, I guess, between folks that have these different orientations, I guess, within philosophy. We talk about Plato's conception of reality. We talk about his allegory of the cave, concept of the Logos. We talk about how we can understand Logos with um, a few examples. Um, Obviously, there's the biblical reference with uh, Jesus, and then there's Heidegger's Dasein. So the Logos has been used in many, many, many contexts. And so we talk about what it is and then how it's been used in some context. Talk about the four ideas of reality, Descartes' methodology, and the cogito, along with free will. We talk about Hume and his epistemology, sentiments, free will, and a little bit of racial naturalism. We talk about Kant's uh, a priori and a posteriori knowledge, uh, along with his transcendental ideal uh, idealism. We then move to Nietzsche. Uh, we talk about Nietzsche as a philosopher of difference his self-knowledge and self-education, how Nietzsche defines culture, uh, the two sacraments and the four enemies of culture. Uh, the, the part here on, on Nietzsche, I, I mean, I've said many times, I say it in the conversation, I'm a big fan of Nietzsche. I've read his philosophy many, many times. And um, I feel like that part of the conversation became more conversational, more, you know, thought provoking in many ways. And, and it was really, really nice part of the conversation. I mean, the, the whole conversation is wonderful, but that part became more and more conversational. And, um, I really enjoyed that, that bit of it. We then end by talking about Hannah Arndt, her ideas about political life as authentic living, her ideas of plurality and intersubjectivity, talk about her ideas of labor, work and action. And then we talk about human dignity and human rights. And again, Really, really wonderful part of the conversation is towards the end. I'd say the last half hour is about uh, that part of it. And really, it's just interesting that, you know, we're both kind of thinking out loud about this. You know, he's changed his ideas and opinions on on Hannah Arndt's uh, 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 views on dignity and and human rights. Um, 
and he doesn't have all the answers and I, I certainly don't have all the answers. And it was interesting to kind of have this part of the conversation. It's like, well, how could that be? Or, or what about here? And, and, and that way it felt really uh, much like a dialogue and a conversation and this kind of pushing and pulling in a really constructive and healthy way. And uh, I got a lot of value out of that part of the, the conversation. Uh, again, conversation is uh, over three and a half hours, closer to four. Uh, so if you're listening to this in one sitting, um, wonderful, you know, grab a big cup of coffee or, or a really big uh, uh, cup of tea and enjoy it. Uh, if you're listening to it in parts, again, uh, I think there's some natural breaking points. Um, we really kind of have the first part of the conversation talking about uh, uh, Plato and Descartes. There's the middle part, which was about Hume and, and um, Kant. And then the second half of the conversation is Nietzsche and, and Arndt, which is basically how his book is constructed. And so there are some kind of natural breaking points that you'll hear and I sort of kind of unofficially have like these transition points so you can kind of hear it. So um, it, it's a, uh, However, however, which way you listen to it is fine as, uh, as long as you, you take it in and um, really hopefully is uh, really valuable for a lot of people out there. And so now I bring him, John Douglas McCready. I'm here with John Douglas McCready. Is that right? McCready. McCready. McCready, mm -hmm. excuse me. How's it going? It's great. I'm good. I'm, I'm so happy that you've uh, decided to come on the podcast, and we can we can uh, talk for for a little bit about uh, all things philosophy. So um, my my goal always when when I do any podcast, but even philosophy, is to to get in the weeds as much as possible, but then also for stuff for listeners to to learn. And so uh, I wouldn't want it to be something like uh, too cursory, right? That's uh, you can read cliff notes and stuff for that. So anytime I'm doing stuff, I like getting into a lot of the details, which is, which is what I'm so excited about. Cause you've written a really nice book, uh, a continental guide to philosophy. Uh, I, I think it's fabulous and does uh, really, really nice job. So we'll talk about that. And so, yeah, so just tell folks who you are, what you do, and about the book and all that good stuff. Yeah, well, thanks very much for having me. Uh, my name is John McCree. I teach at Collin College in Plano, Texas, and I teach mostly introductory uh, courses in philosophy and ethics and logic and social and political philosophy. Um, and the book, A Continental, Philosoph a Continental Guide to Philosophy, is uh, a kind of intervention. Uh, into teaching philosophy, uh, because when I looked for a textbook, uh, most of the textbooks are written from an analytic perspective or a pragmatist perspective. But there aren't a lot of accessible, affordable textbooks for philosophy teachers out there from a continental perspective. And so the title of the book is, is um, a kind of uh, intervention into textbooks to offer these classically read philosophy texts, but read from a continental perspective. Because if you read someone like Jill Deleuze, he's reading Hume mm -hmm. and he's reading Kant, mm -hmm. right? But, um, but when you introduce these thinkers to uh, undergraduates, most of the textbooks available are written from more of an analytic perspective. And you don't get that, you, you can't really foster an interest in continental philosophy. Uh, and so my book is trying to um, foster that kind of interest in continental philosophy and get uh, students reading so that they can then find these other uh, continental philosophers accessible and interesting. Yeah, I, so it absolutely does that. I mean, I, I've had people sometimes they'll come up to me and they'll, they'll say like, you know, I wanna, I wanna get into philosophy, but you know, I just, where do you start and isn't that stuff really like dense and their books are usually like a thousand pages and like, what do you, and you know, if people ask me, where do I start? Or there's a, like a good, like a secondary source or something. And, um, it says, it's, it's always weird when people ask me, people ask me this in psychology too. And I never know what to say. I'm just like, read the original source. Like, why are you going to read? You know, I just never know what to say. Right. And read Freud. Um, yeah, read Freud. Yeah. Read, uh, <laughs> read interpretation of dreams. Uh, you know, um, this, all of this stuff is, is important, whether you agree with it or disagree with it. 
And uh, but yeah, it's it's like well, I don't know, just just uh, go read Aristotle, right? The ethics is great, you know, whatever. And um, and sometimes people just kind of want that uh, very readily accessible, but uh, not too watered down kind of uh, book. And uh, your book really does that. I mean, I, I I when I when when I read it, I I didn't really I don't try not to have any expectations of things, and so I was like, oh, let me just check this out, and I was like, holy shit, this is actually like really good. Like this is like for someone that like doesn't um, like isn't in philosophy, I, I feel like they could read it and be like, oh, okay, I get many of these uh these philosophers and their ideas and things like that and and just just to kind of uh do the breakdown here uh the book is divided into three parts um uh metaphysics epistemology ethics and so you you choose uh, uh, i'm assuming this was there was some uh, intention behind this but plato and descartes for metaphysics uh hume and kant for epistemology and uh nietzsche and hannah arndt for ethics which uh those are all appropriate right i don't think you can really touch anybody better for those for those particular topics but uh, was there you know there's obviously many philosophers and you know like you didn't put aristotle in there right you didn't put uh other other folks in there other big heavyweights what, what was the kind of idea between the uh six that you chose yeah well i um the impetus for the book came from Brent Atkins book, um, uh, a guide to uh, ethics and moral philosophy, which was also published by Edinburgh University Press. Mm -hmm. And when I got that book, I had the same feeling mm -hmm. that you had. I said, oh my gosh, here's an affordable, accessible book that I can put in the hands of students and they will immediately be able to start thinking and reasoning uh, about ethical and moral problems uh, and, I'll, and it will do it from a continental perspective. And so I immediately wrote uh, Carol McDonald at, at Edinburgh University Press, and I said, I hope you are also <laughs> currently working on an introduction to philosophy and an introduction to social political philosophy. And she wrote back and said, uh, no, we're not, but would you like to write that book? And I go. said, okay, yes, yes, I would. And I, and I sent back her uh, an outline to her, basically just a kind of sketch. I said, if I did it, I would probably do these thinkers. And it's all of this text that I chose for the book, with the exception of the last one, uh, I had initially chose um, um, Jill Deleuze's final essay on eminence. Mm -hmm. uh, as a as a final uh, concluding chapter, uh, but then someone pointed out, "Wow, you should do you know Hannah Arendt," and I said, "Yes, of course." I'm it's already working on Arendt. So there was a the uh, lecture that she did, "Labor Work Action." It's it's such a good um, short piece that distills the work she does in the human condition, and so it was just a perfect way to end the book. So I chose that. But but Plato's Sophists, which I begin the book with. I mean, uh, Emmanuel Levinas makes use of it, Jill Deleuze makes use of it, Martin Heidegger makes use of it, and it is precisely those lectures that aren't attended uh, mm -hmm. when she was studying with Heidegger. So it was just a perfect way to begin mm -hmm. the book. And I think it does a good job of parsing out the metaphysical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very difficult dialogue. I, I remember telling a, a, a few people that I was going to suggest that, um, uh, or, or, or include uh, Plato Sophist in my course for undergraduates, and they thought, "My God, what are you doing? Why not? Why not the use of Frodo or something? You know, the apology, mm -hmm. something like that." But mm -hmm. I have found that students are capable of understanding uh, the problems at stake in that dialogue, and they're capable of thinking through um, uh, the argument. So um, it's been a good choice. Yeah, I think with that one in particular, it's it is a tough read, but it feels like it's one that has a big payoff. I guess it's it's, it's something that's like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it was worth going through all that, you know, all that heavy dialogue stuff. It it, it makes it makes a lot of sense, and so we talk about it in the book. I guess the before I ask like the the first big question, um, you know, I mean, you teach philosophy. I'm assuming you have you know that your background's in philosophy and trained in philosophy. What's kind of your um, area of expertise or who who and what are you mostly studying researching writing teaching on so i'm mostly interested in uh, ethics and social and political philosophy and, and if uh, if there's a question that consumes me 
um, that keeps me up at night mm -hmm. is what are uh, my obligations uh, to my neighbor mm -hmm. and, and why should I fulfill them? To put it in more uh, crass terms, why should I not kill my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And I think if you don't have an answer to that question, um, then that's uh, deeply problematic. If you can't give a reason for why you shouldn't do that, um, or for why you should care for your neighbor, I, I think um, I, I've always been convinced by Emmanuel Levinas that ethics is first philosophy. Mm -hmm. That immediate relationship that we have with other human beings is primary, and and that's sort of the impetus in in my first book on human dignity. But it's also uh, the impetus for um, fostering interest in philosophy, because I think we need to think, as Hannah Arendt says, think about what we're doing, and especially what we're doing with one another in our communities. Yeah. Well, uh, it's, a, it's very interesting. I, I already have a million questions to follow up on, so we'll, we'll get there. So, <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, let's start with the, the big one. Uh, actually, I was talking about this with somebody uh, recently. Um, well, a few people actually, and uh, say, what, what is, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, so it's always interesting to see what people's answers are. What is continental and analytic philosophy? Now, I have an idea of what those things are in my mind, right? But it is a weird thing to kind of explain and define. And uh, when I've asked other people that teach philosophy or other people that write on this, I always get a slightly different answer. I remember I asked, um, I asked um, Simon Critchley this, and he gave a very interesting answer. I think he went to John Stuart Mill and gave me some interesting answer on it. I was like, oh, I was, was not expecting that answer. It was very, very interesting. Uh, how, how do you, how do you usually break down uh, continental and analytic philosophy, and then why are they so, um, or tr many times, why are they kind of contentious towards each other? Yeah, I mean, on this question, I've been really influenced by Andrew Kutrafellow's uh, um, intervention to this uh, question. Uh, and the way he sees it, and I, I think he's right, is that the two traditions really begin to emerge out of the dualism of Kant, the, the distinction between concepts and intuitions. Mm. And the idea that in Kant is that Certainly, he agrees that our knowledge begins with our sensory experience. Like, he wants to reject a kind of idealism that says we can't know uh, uh, or we, we don't have any uh, purchase on our, uh, the external world. He thinks, of course, our senses are being activated by objects external to our bodies. We may not know what things as they are in themselves, but we do know that there are objects external to us. So there is this givenness that we intuit. Um, and, you know, in, in the A deduction, in the, in the critique of pure reason, he says, you know, first there's this apprehension of the object, and then there is the um, uh, representation of that object with the imagination, and then it's recognized by reason. Continental philosophy wants to return us to our imminent experience in time to begin thinking about how we're intuiting uh, objects in the world. Hmm. And so the emphasis for continental philosophy is going to be from the side of intuition, not to the exclusion of concepts, but emphasizing the givenness in our imminent experience. So time, subjectivity, bodily orientation to the world. I mean, think about the way Merleau-Ponty talks about uh, the blind person, you know, taking in and knowing the city mm -hmm. inside his body, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, those experiences of color. Um, so all, all of that is that continental orientation to the imminent and embodied experience in the world and in time. On, on the other side, uh, um, analytic philosophy emphasizes the conceptual side of that dualism, not to the exclusion of our imminent experience of the world, but saying that, you know, agreeing with Kant that the, the givenness is blind without some kind of logical conceptual organization. And so there's an emphasis on 
logically organizing our sensory experience. And that gives rise, and I, this is what uh, Kutrafella says, to a kind of um, intractable division. You know, he thinks of it in terms of the, uh, uh, the War of the Roses in Shakespeare, but there are these two houses that emerge. And um, all kinds of people try to get them back together. Richard Rorty, you know, and pragmatists try to get the houses back together, but it's sort of an intractable division. And I think if you, if you read the history of philosophy, what you find is this sort of dualism being recapitulated in a lot of different ways. In the book, I, I talk about how Nietzsche's uh, um, Apollonian and Dionysian uh, drives are representative of this conceptual and intuitive uh, uh, distinction, but also the two traditions. Mm -hmm. right? And that's not to say that analytic philosophers aren't concerned with art, uh, and continental philosophers are, they are concerned with those things, or that continental philosophers aren't concerned with science. You know, they can be. Um, but I see continental philosophy as a broad, tradition of philosophical inquiry that includes um, theoretical orientations like phenomenology and critical theory, but also methodological orientations like hermeneutics and, um, and psychoanalysis. And, and so it's hard to get a definition because there's this sort of um, stream that comes out of Kant that wants to emphasize the givenness of our human experience. I mean, think about Levinas. He's, a, he's criticizing phenomenology, mm -hmm. right? But he, but he's also, uh, has a, has a purchase in phenomenology. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, yeah, that, that's, that's the way I understand it. But the real, the real emphasis and here, I follow, uh, um, Leonard Lawler's, uh, Kind of analysis of, of continental philosophy it's this attempt to renew thinking mm. to return to thinking not discursive logical analysis but thinking again in our imminent experience what does it mean to be in the world with others uh, and what are our responsibilities um, and how, how does truth disclose aesthetically instead of logically those are the kinds of questions i think the continental philosophers are interested in is the kind of the animosity between uh, the two, um, uh, you know, subfields, I guess, in philosophy is continental analytic. Is that animosity just a, a, like a difference in style or emphasis or temperament, right? Obviously, one's not right or wrong, but um, is it more of what are we emphasizing, right? So analytic philosophers are going to have a particular emphasis, uh, whereas continental will have maybe multiple points where they emphasize things. But is, is that why they just kind of can't get along very well? Or is it very, I mean, like some people do, but there's always this kind of undercurrent of like some, you know, did you just see the world differently? Or is there's perspectives or is it point of, points of emphasis? Why has there, I guess, traditionally and still, I guess you could say to this day, this very kind of frosty kind of uh, interaction between continental and analytic schools of thought? Yeah, I, I think maybe that conflict is perhaps overdrawn. I mean, we have, you see people like Robert Pippin, uh, you know, who are clearly in the analytic tradition, but reading continental authors and, and writing about Nietzsche, right? right. Uh, and then you have, you know, you have continental philosophers like Jill Deleuze who are making use of analytic thinkers and Judith Butler, you can't think about without J.L. Austin's, uh, you know. But, so I, I, I think maybe that conflict is overdrawn, but I think it, it really does have to do with the the way the philosopher, the particular philosopher, begins to emphasize um, uh, what we can know and how we access reality, and what our responsibilities are to other, it, or what our responsibilities are to others, and it, it, it begins with either you begin in your imminent experience in the world, as someone like say Heidegger would do, or you think listen, uh, without some kind of logical analysis about the statements we make about the world, we can't understand our givenness. So that, that kind of emphasis is going to lead you in more of an analytic or 
a third way I think pragmatists understand themselves. You know, to a continental philosopher, pragmatists look like analytic philosophers, but they they would uh, most of them would reject that view and see themselves as a kind of third path through through the divide. You know, um, I wonder. You know, interestingly, I wonder if uh, some of this is all kind of a moot point. Uh, I think at the end of the day, if you're trying to find, um, you know, what's real, how do we know things, and how do we interact with other 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 beings, uh, and do that in a what let's say ethical or moral way, you know, I think that there's, you know, I think that's really what people are trying to ask, but. But I do think there is also utility too, right? I think you know the the very big systems that continental philosophy does um, is really important. But I think the logic and math and science that uh, analytic philosophers make is also super important as well. So I I, I somewhat uh, liken it to uh, in psychology, uh, especially clinical psych, you have people that have different theoretical orientations, right? So you have folks that will be psychodynamic uh, and or psychoanalytic kinds of uh, clinicians. You'll have people that do cognitive behavioral uh, uh, therapy and maybe do family systems or whatever. And they're all fine. They all have their place. You know, one's not more superior than the other. I mean, if you talk to kind of very zealous advocates for one, they'll say why this is the thing that saves everyone or whatever, but they all have their place. And really it's just a way in which you see people and see the world. And it's just, it's a framework. So I, I there's, there's a, I feel like there's some kind of like transferable bit there. So it, it seems, it sounds similar in some ways. I, I wonder if one, one analogy might work. I remember being at the uh, Tate Modern in London and their curation of realists and and the uh abstract expressionists mm -hmm. were in two rooms that were adjoining mm -hmm. and they had curated them so well that for the first time i saw the kind of historical context for these two movements so there was like diego rivera but there was also jackson pollock mm -hmm. you know and and these are two ways of looking at the world and trying to represent what you see Right, and, and it is a point of uh, um, emphasis. Um, you know, Jackson Pollock wanting to give expression to the unconscious in some way in his mm -hmm. paintings, and mm -hmm. to show the activity of painting rather than some kind of image. Whereas Diego Rivera wants to show bodies, mm -hmm. right, in motion and in space, and yeah. that. And there are there are historical and political reasons for that, mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that the two kind of houses of philosophy are the same way. These are two traditions that we have to, uh, if you want to do philosophy, you're probably going to end up in one of the two camps. But I think uh, taking, uh, uh, you know, crossing boundaries and, and, and uh, visiting the other side is, is always helpful and makes uh, good contributions. Yeah, I'll just uh, tell a quick story about that. So. Uh, both my uh, wife and my brother have a, uh, they have a bachelor's of fine arts and they both uh, uh, have a, the, their degree in uh, graphic design. And, um, and so they would always tell me about art, right? They about art history, they're talking about the historical pieces of it, the political pieces of it, and then the technical side and all of these things. And, you know, I would, you know, just listen and take it all in, but, you know, I never really saw myself as like a big art person. I never really got it if if that makes sense i respect it so i just never really like clicked over for me and i remember one time uh i think i think what really clicked over for me was i was reading i was reading heidegger's lectures on nietzsche those like that four volume by um what's his name i forgot who compiled it or whatever but and there's a lot of that in there and uh and then i went back and i was reading you know Nietzsche again and his his emphasis on art and then I was reading Heidegger on it and then I was reading uh, Gadamer on it and I was like and I started reading all this stuff and like I just kind of saw it with a different lens and I remember I would tell my wife or I you know, sent a message to my brother I'm like you know do, do you understand like how like art is really telling the truth aspects and they're like yeah I learned that like year two in, in uh, undergrad and like, welcome, you've arrived. Like you had to take the long way up the mountain, do the most abstract version of this. You know, we got that like, you know, year two, good, good job. Right. And uh, so they, they will completely uh, 
uh, ridicule me. But uh, yes, I, I totally get it. I had to get it in my way. And we, I, I remember one time we had a um, pretty interesting debate about Jackson Pollock. You know, I thought it was bullshit for the longest time. I was like, oh, God, give me a break, right? And it took me forever to finally get it. And then I was like, I get it. And I get it. You know, so it's interesting how there is, uh, in terms of the arts and the humanities, there is a lot of uh, crossover and, and how much, uh, I would say probably in a lot of continental philosophers, or they're the ones that talk about it seemingly the most, is uh, uh, a lot of emphasis on um, the extreme importance of of art and uh, the different mediums it can take and so it's just very interesting understanding the different contexts in history and politics and you know where it kind of sits and all that kind of stuff yeah uh, um okay so let's let's dive into uh plato uh first and so i, I it's uh it's been a while since i've actually read um plato uh it was a couple of years ago i reread some of the stuff so as i reading the book i was reminded of much of this and uh i guess the the, the one big question that, that, you know, you mentioned and kind of starts out is about this idea of reality. Now, I guess the one question that's there is why is asking about what is real so fundamental to existence, right? Like, why do we need to know that, right? Now, we're not going to go into postmodernism, right? Even though that's kind of sort of where we're at, maybe. But... Um, for the Greeks, this was like a huge question. Like, you know, what's, what is real? What does it mean to be real? And, um, you know, why was this important to Plato to ask this? Was he the first person? Like, you know, what was it about him asking it and the way in which he asks it so kind of momentous? Yeah, I mean, he, he certainly wasn't the first person to ask. I mean, you can go back to, you know, Indian philosophers mm -hmm. uh, um, and people like Chuang Tzu, who are considering this question about what is real, what is the totality mm -hmm. right, that lies behind everything. So in Thales, Heraclitus, Democritus, I mean, all, all these are sort of predecessors that are all trying to give an account of mm -hmm. reality. But I think maybe uh, one way to think about why Plato thinks this is an important question is the death of Socrates, his teacher, mm -hmm. who makes his mark uh, by trying to engage in these dialogues where uh, he raises questions that ultimately don't get answered, and he tries to persuade them. But then Plato sees at the trial of Socrates that even the wisest man in Athens cannot persuade this uh, body of leaders not to kill him, mm -hmm. not to convict him. Um, and why is that? Um, and I think, uh, I think Plato was then realized that we have to have some kind of normative uh, uh, way of determining what is real and what is not, to, to demarcate what is illusion and what is truth, because patho and persuasion is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And if we and if left up to uh, these leaders, they're going to choose sophists who make the weaker argument stronger and the stronger argument weaker, and that's not sufficient for Plato. I think Plato really wanted to find some measure in the world or outside of the world. For him, it's outside of the world um, to uh, to guide our thinking, and he's convinced that it's possible to arrive at truth through thinking and language, that we can grasp reality, that it will show up in our conversations. Light up is probably a better way. Uh, so I, I think that's what's important for him. For us, um, we hate to be lied to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We, we don't want to find out that we're living in a simulation. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We want, we want, uh, when someone tells us that they love us, we want to believe them, right? When someone uh, promises us something, we want them to deliver. We, we want something to count on. We don't, as, as uh, human animals, we don't really do very well with ambiguity and, and instability. We are looking for stability. And so I think the question of reality 
uh, the metaphysical question, what is real is, is fundamental and central to us. Are, are we real? You know, and that gives rise to a host of other questions. Yeah, certainly. I guess uh, this might be jumping ahead a little bit, but I guess, um, you know, does it really matter to an individual if it is real or not? So here's what I mean. If I believe something is real, in many ways, that's all that matters, right? If it's actually objectively real, let's just say that for a minute. You know, does it matter? Now, this might be very true for concepts, right? Such as love or hate or, you know, affection or loyalty or things like that, right? Um, you know, is, is the cup real? Well, you know, th that does have implications, right? So maybe there's dimensions to this, but there's plenty of people that would say, yeah, I don't want to know that. I just want to believe it how I want. And it might actually be real, but I don't want to believe that it is. And so there is, and, and, and I'm not trying to place a certain value judgment on that. I think you could probably in, in many uh, uh, individualized moments or scenarios possibly make the argument that that is probably the better choice to say, mm, yeah, you know what? That's probably a good idea that you believe it that way. Right. If, 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 you know, my, you know, relative, that's a senior citizen believes in an afterlife and believes in a deity and it believes all these things to help her get through a tough time. You know, I, all the evidence we have and, and many of the things and what I certainly believe is that that's all, you know, a bunch of shit, right? I don't think it's, I don't think it's fucking real. It doesn't matter. Why does it matter? Right. It, it doesn't matter if it's helpful for someone and it's not harmful to them necessarily in a, in a really, really, really dark moment or to other folks, why would it matter if, if it's real or if it's not real? So how much does the belief of the reality come into play here? And maybe I'm getting too far away from Plato, but uh, just, just as I'm, you know, thinking about the idea of, of realness or reality. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some, um, there are some questions uh, that we aren't capable of answering. And so, uh, that we may need to, all, the best we can get is belief. And sometimes those beliefs will serve us and sometimes they won't. But I think the problem is, is that that can't be the only, we can't just have belief and opinion. That's not enough. Mm. Uh, there are things that we want to know. For example, um, even to say that I believe this is true, even to make a statement like that is already uh, uh, to make a truth claim yes. about the belief that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that suggests that the human being already has a desire for it to be true, mm -hmm. right? So there's already, and I think when this comes out of Plato, Socrates says that the, in the symposium, you know, that, that there is this erotic desire for wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's, it's a recognition that we don't have it. That's that poros, he says, mm. that uh, this eros is born between poros and plenty, having and not having. Mm -hmm. we, we recognize this sort of <clears throat> um, privation of wisdom, and we seek it precisely because of that. And, so, and, and then Aristotle in the metaphysics says all human beings desire to know. And what they desire to know are the causes of things, the ultimate causes of things. And so I think the Greeks were very aware that we were dissatisfied with not knowing. Mm. So I don't think we'll ever be satisfied uh, with simply belief. I do think we lie to ourselves. Certainly. Um, I, I often say uh, to my students that, you know, the next time you're on a date with your beloved, uh, sitting across from them, uh, you look at them and say how beautiful, how wonderful, how charming and humorous. And here's what you know that you're not admitting to yourself, that across from you is a skin bag full of urine and feces and nails and hair and pus. You know all of this and you know that's also the case for you, but you, you're not going to know that right now. What you're going to know is how beautiful, how charming, how humorous, so lovely to be with this person. Mm -hmm. Right. So there are things that we know 
mm-hmm. that we choose not to know. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Yes, yes, and I do think that it does come on different dimensions and and and, and layers, which I guess is is kind of a, a tie into you know Plato had these general and specific categories, you know the forms, uh, and so you can maybe you can just kind of give us the uh, the the recap of his cave analogy to kind of maybe talk about the forms and the and the principles and things like that about about how he used that to try and understand reality. Yeah, so in the Republic, um, uh, in book seven, uh, he's asked about, Socrates is asked about education, and he gives the cave analogy as a response to education. It's interesting. It's, it's, it is an epistemological uh, analogy, and it links up with uh, the divided line, which is a more abstract mathematical version of the cave analogy. So maybe I'll say something about both of those. But the, in the cave analogy, he says, Imagine these prisoners who have been chained by the neck from birth, and they're, they can't move. They can only look at the wall in front of them. And what they see on the wall in front of them are shadows. And they're so accustomed to that, that for them, this is all that reality is, simply the shadows. And behind them, there is a walkway with things being carried back and forth. And behind them is a fire, and it projects these shadows onto the wall. Uh, and so reality for him um, is not simply the things behind the prisoners that are being carried back and forth. Those are images or real representations. What's real for him is what is outside of the cave. And and there, these are the forms. So on the divided line, there's a move from images, which uh, can be understood as our sensory experience, the way uh, we're our bodies uh, and our senses are impacted by the external world and they produce these images and the imagination is what he says produces these images. And then up from that is the, um, uh, up from that is the, the real things. And then there is the mathematical structure of things and then the understanding of their ultimate forms. And the forms for him are these immaterial paradigms of everything that exists. Um, And that is what is ultimately real for Plato. And these are mind independent. All right, when we have an idea of something, what we have, uh, the object of that idea is the form. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so for him, if you, you can have knowledge by having an idea about something, you can give a definition of some kind of, uh, thing that you perceive with your senses and you can give it a name and you can give an account of it and say why it is. Socrates is a man and a man is, um, you know, an animal with reason who's also mortal. You can give some kind of account of that. But to have wisdom for him is to grasp this form. And what he says is, is that then at the top of the divided line or getting out of the cave, you always come back into the cave. So it's bringing this this grasp of the form back into your sensory experience so that when you encounter something, you say, ah, I know what this is because I understand what the form is. Um, and it's interesting that, you know, the way he depicts the, uh, the prisoner getting out of the cave, he's dragged out. We actually don't want, we don't desire that, that liberation, right? And we fight it. And then when the person comes back into the cave, Everyone tries to kill them because they're they're challenging these sensory uh, representations and, and these habitual ways of thinking about the world. And uh, I think it's a good picture of the philosopher. The philosopher is this disruptive uh, um, figure who calls into question our commonly held beliefs and opinions and tries to redirect us, turn the soul, as, as Plato talks about, back towards the forms. But the, the, the forms always have to be rooted against the reality, right? That's the whole thing, right? You don't have forms without the reality. Now, the forms may be the reality for many people or in many situations, but they're rooted in, in the form. So, for example, I mean, this might not be the best example, but, you know, if I have a ball, right? Well, there's an idea I have of what it means. So, you know, this is it's hard to 
uh, to, to clear my, my brain of Heidegger. So, you know, <laughs> so I, I have the fall, right? And all of the things that we know about what we call, we label this the ball, right? Like it, you could call it something else. We decide to call it a ball, but really it's, you know, it, it's made of, you know, whatever the materials and it's stitched together and it might have designs and colors or not or whatever. But if I look at one side of this, you know, I have an idea because I know what a ball is. At the moment, I'm holding a baseball for, for listeners. <laughs> um, of what's on the other side. You know, the contours of it, the shape of it. You know, if, if I know the design. Oh, okay. I have these priors, if you will. So, I, I'm, I'm infusing that into what I'm trying to understand about what this is, even if I don't know it. Now, that's different if you have had something that's replicated over and over and over and over and over and over, right? You know, I've seen a baseball, you know, a million times in my lifetime or whatever. So I have an idea. I would be a genuine surprise if it wasn't that way. And in, in, a, in the same way, when we have things in, in the world, we have the ways in which they're represented or the forms. And so it kind of goes back to that question of, in my mind, which is, does it matter, right? It does, you know, it's a sort of a value piece to it, but it's, there are things that are what you could say objectively real, but if we only see a certain aspect or certain side or certain angle or perspective, well, that's all we have. But does it, but it does it have to matter to know what reality is? Because I don't know if you can always know that there are so many things in reality we don't know that we won't know, and that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. But that might be the wrong question, and so because again, right? I'm trying to unthink other things, right? But it's <laughs> we only have our perception, we only have our being to know those things in the world. They may or may not exist, right? There, there are things in the, in the world that we don't know that do exist in objective reality, let's say. But if we never know it, why does it matter? Because we can't know it. And, and, and I guess that's the thing with the, with the, the cave analogy, right? Is it, we have the forms, like the guys, they're chained to the neck. They only see their shadows on the wall in front of them because they can't see behind them. Obviously, it's connected to something that's happening behind them. But there's other things happening behind them they, they can't know or see or, or, or have sensations for. Does that really matter if they can't necessarily know it? Now, some people may say, of course it does. But other people may say, uh, not really. They're not, it's not going to be in their locus of experience. So I, how, do you, how do you think in terms of the how does it matter kind of thing about knowing is this real or is this not real kind of question? Well, I think there are limits and I, I think this is Kant's point, right? There are things that we can know and there are things that we can't and we need to get clear on what we can know and stop trying to uh, claim that we know things that we don't, mm -hmm. right? So setting those limits on what we can know about reality, I think are important. And this is also Hume's point, right? But the distinction between matters of fact and relations of ideas is a way of saying, look, there are things ultimately that you can't know. You can't know the substance of bread, right? You can experience the effects of bread when you eat it, it nourishes you, but you're never going to know uh, the substance of bread. And, I, and this is Kant's point too. You can't know things as that they are in themselves, but look, we, we know that a square has four equal sides, right? And all bachelors are unmarried men. We can make claims like this, right? <laughs> so uh, it, it's not that we don't have any purchase on reality, but there's a limited purchase. And, and Plato, I think, was ambitious. <laughs> it, <clears throat> I think he wants to have, um, you know, a greater purchase on reality than perhaps uh, we could. You know, this is some of the problems sometimes <laughs> because I, it's one of those things that like at the time you can almost see the, I mean, obviously Plato's, you know, huge, huge for, for, for humans in our human history and for thinking, but like, you know, we know now from quantum mechanics and not everything is the same twice, even at the smallest levels. Of course, he didn't know that. And, and I just wonder you know, how much of this stuff as we continue to think about things and, and know things, um, you know, it does shape our ideas of what we say is reality and what isn't. And, you know, there will be people that will very dogmatically say like, this is true, right? This is real and this is not, right? 
Did JFK get assassinated on November 22nd, 1963? Yes. Yes. That objectively happened, right? Now, if you go 500 years into the future, people may debate that, right? But that's not the only, that fact is not the only thing that is real or is true. That is a, it, it's a kind of like what, um, what you were saying earlier. Like if you were to describe a human, well, you could describe them like 20 million different ways, right? They're not all going to be wrong, right or wrong. It's just depending on the person saying it is a perspective. So then how you say, well, what's that objective reality, right? And, and that's, a, that's a very hard thing to kind of like really, really, really know because we probably won't, which I think can, for some people can be very disorienting. Right, because it's not grounded, right, and and that's problematic for some people. Yeah, and I, I, I mean, this is the question. And the sophist is, you know, look, we want to know what a sophist is. So, what is the essential nature of a sophist? That's what they try to determine, and they do it six times. Mm -hmm. they, they hatch this method of division, in which they're going to arbitrarily choose a starting point and then begin dividing and trying to locate the sophists in each of those things. And what they end up with are six different accounts mm -hmm. or six different natures of the sophists. And, and none so of them, none of them are being. Right. Right. Exactly. So, 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 so what are the, what are the six? Uh -huh. Right. So that's, that's the thing. Uh -huh. Each of them is, I mean, the, the, these sophists do each of the things they do. They're a hunter of rich young men. They're, uh, you know, a retail retailer of learning about the soul there. And then the final one, they purify souls from false beliefs. Sounds a lot like a philosopher. And that's what really disturbs them, right? Then they think, well, God, we've described a sophist. And the initial provocation of the dialogue is, how do we know who the true philosophers are versus the false philosophers. Well, let's figure out what a false philosopher is and then we'll be able to determine what the true philosopher is. And, and Heidegger makes an interesting point about the sophists, which I, I think is right, is that you know, in this dialogue, what you're watching is the performance of philosophical thinking. That you're seeing Dasein in his philosophical mm -hmm. existence mm -hmm. in this dialogue. And what I always say about the dialogues are these are manuals of thinking. You're not going to get an answer to this question, but sure. what you're going to get is like a Jackson Pollock painting. You're going to get the activity of philosophy that you sort of that washes over you. And when you finish the dialogue, you think, oh, OK, so this is I just experienced thinking. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I think that's what's so brilliant about the, um, the dialogues. It's not so much that they're going to tell us what reality is. Right. On the contrary, I think this dialogue fails miserably uh, in terms of identifying the, the nature of the sophist. You get some uh, indications of what a sophist is. You know, they're uh, people who, who um, are appearance makers versus a philosopher who's a likeness maker. Mm -hmm. um, but that's about as close as they get. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's instructive, right? Because it's a type of template, right? It's a, of sorts. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a way in which to have a process of sorts, right? Not necessarily to give the concrete answers. Um, so the next big kind of uh, topic here, there's many people that talk about this. Um, I think many people talk about it uh, incorrectly. Um, so, uh, what is the logos? the logos right and how does it apply to plato's idea of being uh so we'll start there and then have some follow-ups on that yeah so logos uh, comes from the verb legain which means to speak but it also means to gather and for them it meant to gather your thoughts in a symbolic system of signs and, and this is um to give an account in language mm -hmm what something is. So that kind of um, proposition when I say Socrates is a man, well, um, I'm pointing to this figure in front of me that I name Socrates, and I'm describing him. I'm predicating of him that he's a man. I'm giving an account of what he is. But then the question becomes, well, what is a man? <laughs> Right. So before I can really know what Socrates is, you're just saying he's a man, but what, what exactly is that? And then, mm -hmm. you know, you, maybe you give an Aristotelian answer and you say, well, he's the 
He's the logos having animal. He's the one who can speak and give an account in language and make distinctions. And uh, he's also mortal and you give a host of other descriptions. And um, so logos is giving an account. And uh, in the seventh letter of the way Plato uh, describes the necessary features of knowledge, you have to have a name and you have to have a definition and you have to have an image. So when you apply the name to an image, but you don't have an account, all you have is opinion. Mm -hmm. But when you can give an account of something, then you know what you're talking about. Then you can even have a dialogue. You can't really have a dialogue with just opinion unless somebody on the other side can give you an account of what they mean. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and then in each of those accounts, um, there is an aspiration to the forms for Plato. That when you say Socrates is a man and you give an account of that, Plato would want to say there is a form of the human. Mm -hmm. It has all the constitutive features that any particular human is going to have in order to be human. And so the philosopher would be the person who knows that. And then they are capable of copying their wisdom about the forms into language. And it's precisely in those dialogues where you're speaking and gathering together your thoughts in the system of signs and a kind of back and forth conversation that something lights up in the language. Mm. And, and, and we say it kind of colloquially, we'll say, I see what you're saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Which means to say something just flashed up in the way you organize those signs together. And I'm like a flash of lightning that sort of illuminates things. And for a moment, you grasp the truth of things, right? And I think that's, that's that Heideggerian notion of aletheia, this uncovering that happens in the, in the speech acts that we do. Mm -hmm. This is the, the truth, right? Al yeah. Al aletheia is the, the truth uh, aspect of it. So... So for so let me let me get this right. So because again, there's a lot of unlearning I always have to do, right? So it's the the logos is this idea of of gathering, and right you said the, the idea of the um you said the the name the the image and what was the other one um the definition the definition, but it, it, this is through language. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that, see, that's that. Right. That's another problem, right? Because language is one form of communicating something. You can communicate those concepts or those ideas in many other ways outside of uh, written or spoken language. Is there any way why language is the vehicle here in terms of the logos right, of, of of these ideas? Yeah, I mean, you mean for Plato. Yeah, um, later, yeah. Yeah, I mean, well, one, one anecdote about him, whether it's true or not, is that he was a poet and a dramatist before he met <laughs> Socrates, and then he burned <laughs> all of his stuff and just became a philosopher, right? Uh, it's a pretty dramatic anecdote about his life. But um, I think uh, for Plato, he thinks that what makes us human is that we are capable, and Aristotle uh, makes this point in the politics, mm -hmm. What makes us human is that we don't just have, uh, we're not just capable of yelping, having a voice, but we're capable of making distinctions in language. Mm -hmm. we, we represent our thoughts in, in a very unique way um, because we're rational animals. Mm -hmm. um, I think Plato, Plato held this too. For him, um, we are capable of knowing reality in language. The problem, of course, of language is, as he describes in the sophist, language is like a net, he says. So we're going to try to capture the sophist in the net of language. But the problem with nets is they have holes. Yes. So each time I say something, I'm simultaneously denying something. Mm -hmm. So every proposition is a covering over, not just a revealing. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I think Plato was to some degree aware of that. And that's the reason he has these dialogues where you have multiple perspectives that you have to take into account. Mm. But maybe another point that you, um, that you, you raise there, or at least gestured towards, which is that we communicate with our bodies too. Yes. Right? Gesture is another way mm -hmm. 
and think of the way things come to you when you're active, mm-hmm. right? But when you're, I, I have been on a treadmill or a bike before where an idea comes to me and I think, my God, I know if I stop pedaling or running, this is just going to evaporate. I'm going to have to memorize <laughs> <laughs> before I get off the treadmill of the body. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it's because there is there is a way in which we communicate with our bodies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, but I think language is central for the Greeks. It's gathering together. There's an interesting uh, uh, novel by Thomas Carlyle, Sartor Resartus. Okay. And, and in there, he says that language is the clothing of thought. Ah, I like that. That's nice. That, that language is the system of signs in which we uh, make our thoughts appear in some way, in a concrete way, either through writing or through speech. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, look. I mean, I, I would, I would totally agree with 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 Plato and the Greeks. I, I'm not disagreeing. I, I think the logos is an important concept because it's trying. There is so much. Um it's it's really hard to find the dividing line between thinking and speaking right um they are very much intertwined um and i will we may come to this later and so i I don't i don't want to get too controversial too early we still got to talk about you know heidegger so you know he's a (laughs) controversial (laughs) Nietzsche too but you know i mean i think that that's why in many ways i i do uh, people are free speech advocates uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and a lot of times that has become very much a, a very obnoxious rallying call for people that just want to do whatever the fuck they want. And I don't agree with that. There are limits. That is res- the, to me, with free speech comes big responsibility. That's never talked about as much. So, so you know, I'm not a very zealous and obnoxious free speech person, but I do think, though, that a lot of it is connected with thinking. And if we are um, having this kind of positive injunction for people where we're trying to alter or change how others may or may not speak, that's going to have an impact on how you think. And I think that that's um, sometimes inadvertently uh, intrusive for, for thinking and for speaking. Now, there's the opposite side of things about how do we correct for things where we are not, um, uh, how do I say this? I don't want to say harmful or offensive, but I'll just say that there are limits to it. But within the Greeks, though, the, the Logos is, is trying to say that how we name something or how we define something or how we have these images is through this idea of language. So is, is the Logos idea trying to encapsulate all of that? What is the connecting points between how we think and how we name things or define it and what that's doing for how we make it for a bigger concept? But how would you say the whole gestalt of the, the Logos is? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I, I would say uh, uh, there's this short little <clears throat> text by Aristotle on dreams where he says, there is no thinking without phantasms. Yeah, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. And, and I know uh, this is gets to representational kind of thinking, and I know there are arguments against that kind of thinking. But yeah. I, I think what it always suggests to me is that there you you will not think without language. Mm-hmm. That language is the system of signs in which thinking uh, starts its engines and begins to move. Uh, and that uh, even if I say something like, you know, um, think of uh, spicy hot Cheetos, you're not going to conjure an image of an orange, bumpy uh, food item. You're going to have an olfactory image of the taste and texture and all of that. And that is a representation, right? There are all kinds of auditory representations, tactile representations mm-hmm. um, that we can. Do so. We're we're these representational kind of beings, and the Greeks understood that. But they thought that language um, and this uh, ability to speak—not just to have voice, but to speak and to make distinctions in language—was the essential feature of the human being. It, it's what allows us to be philosophical. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I, yes, I, I totally agree. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to ask about Heidegger's ideas about this. Uh, but before we get to Heidegger, I'm gonna bring somebody else into the picture here, which is um, <laughs> Jesus. So uh, in um, John one one in the Bible, right? Says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was by God, or whatever it is. <clears throat> In Greek, because that's what uh, the Gospel of John was written in, Koine Greek, um, it's the introduction of the Logos. Right? Yeah. And so it was very, um, ooh, I'm really rusty on my Greek, but I can't, I can't quite recall. It's if in, in the RK in the Logos. Yes, and, I, and I, I'm trying to remember the, um, uh, which... Um, Greek has all these different types of voices or whatever there. It's like the four different types of words. I'm trying to remember which one it was. I can't remember if it was the masculine, the neuter, or the feminine. I, I can't remember at the moment. But the idea was that the Logos was personified in, in you know, to, to say that this concept was in a deity. Like he is thought. He is, you know, he is this ultimate kind of being of sorts was you know it's i think that i mean again i think it's you know quite it's quite a lot of propaganda in my opinion but to think about it philosophically though to put to associate an idea like that that was known to a a person and a deity is at the very least interesting if not somewhat arrogant but you know, how do you, I mean, again, I'm not saying that you, you know, would know all of the theology behind it, but what do you, what are your ideas in using Logos in, in that way? I mean, what comes to mind when I, when I hear that passage is uh, Heraclitus. Uh -huh. so the, the Logos holds always, mm -hmm. right? That there is this um, intelligible order to things that in language, we sort of get on the, the hunt for as we begin to speak and then, and then catch, catch glimpses of along the way. But there is a kind of um, rational order to things that Heraclitus thinks is underlies reality. And, and I think that one way to think about that passage is that what you see in the, in is God understood as the as the intelligible order of things mm -hmm. becoming flesh, which is another way to say bringing thoughts into language, mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. to make appear in a system of signs in flesh, mm -hmm. in voice, um, the intelligible order. And I, I think there's something deeply platonic about that, right? That we can, if we understand forms, and this is what he suggests the philosopher is trying to do, is to in some ways, um, paint paint the forms in a system of signs, right? Mm -hmm. To to make the forms become flesh and dwell among us. And that's in some ways the aspiration of Plato. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say just just on the the biblical point is that um, you know it's a kind of um, uh, my, my recollection of this is a kind of there's a sort of creativeness to it, but. You know, the Gospels are uh, predominantly a narrative, right? And typically in, in narrative as a genre, you take it literal. It's very, very rare, if at all, if you take narrative as uh, figurative. And so while many people will make that move to say, well, you know, this is a representation, you know, this is God made flesh because it's just a, this, this representation of like order and things like that. I, I think you can read it that way. I just don't think that's how the intention was based on all of the other things we know from uh, uh, exegesis, hermeneutics, of what, and what we know of, of a literary genre for understanding literally the context of what comes after um, in, in, well, it wasn't chapters or verses, but in chapter one, and then I think in chapter two is where he turns the water into wine and all that and showing all this, you know, first miracle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, and then there's a, there's a type of propaganda that John is trying to do as a different gospel than the other three. Um, so, you know, I think that there's, 
if you're taking things within the context and you're trying to understand the author, not John, but whoever the author was, um, it's hard to not read it as like a type of, you know, literal narrative. I mean, that's, you, you know, you, you can't just folks try and do that. It'll take, you know, three, four verses and be like, Oh yeah, it's this. And then, you know, want everything else to be like actually happened, actually real. Like if you want the resurrection and you want the crucifixion as an actual event that happened, then you have to have all of that. Cause if it's using the same language, the same, uh, types of Greek and they're using the same types of exegesis, you know, you're not going to have any switch and you won't see it that way if you read in the original language. And so this makes many folks, uh, including Mormons, very upset about this, you know, the whole idea about the Trinity and stuff like that. So I have all this rusty seminary knowledge. Sorry. Okay. Let's get to Heidegger. Okay. <laughs> so how do we see Heidegger's Dasein coming into play with the Logos? I mean, he talks about the Logos all the time, right? He, you know, and, and, uh, I've talked about it plenty of times. I haven't in a while, but you know, Dasein is what it means to be human, right? It is, you know, being there is the literal German translation, right? So it's this idea of only you have your Dasein, right? Dasein's always possessive, right? It's not a way of saying humans in general, right? It's you, the individual, it's your being, right? So how would, would Heidegger come to this approach of Plato's Logos um, and, and how he understands it within his kind of uh, elaborate framework. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, precisely uh, what, what we've talked about already, which is that, um, you know, the way Heidegger understands that dialogue of the sophists is that what you see there is Dasein in his philosophical existence taking a stand on the question of being, mm -hmm. right? And that, uh, and that language is primary for that. How... Uh, you know, what's probably missing from the dialogue, especially for Heidegger, is the way we're already in the world mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and how mm -hmm. we came to have the language we do about that and, right. and how uh, we're understanding our existence in the world. Um, uh, but uh, I think the way Heidegger would, uh, or, or, or what the way he understands the Logos is that the the lighting up of the truth of things, the way things show themselves, happens in our language, in our mm -hmm. coping things. And I think that's what, what um, my point is about seeing these dialogues as manuals of thinking. Mm -hmm. If Plato mm -hmm. is inviting you into this activity of philosophical thinking that's being dramatized in language, and as you follow it, if you're an attentive, close reader of Plato, what you what you will get every now and then as you're reading are these sort of moments where things light up and you catch sight of what he's trying to get you to see. And I, I think that's the way uh, Heidegger understands uh, our knowledge of the truth too. But there's also all the covering over and the right. negation, right. right? So each time we make these claims, we're also negating something. Something's mm -hmm. dropping mm -hmm. out and getting covered over. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it, it, it suggests that philosophy is this ongoing pursuit about the truth of things, right? And the truth doesn't, isn't like an apple that we can hold in our hands, you know, at the end of a dialogue. Uh, uh, it, it's instead, language is a kind of provocation to keep talking and keep thinking mm -hmm. about these questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that makes sense. I think it's, uh, I guess Aristotle is, is what uh, Heidegger, is whom Heidegger lectured on the most, and I think Nietzsche second. I mean, he, he was really in this kind of world and thinking about it. He's, I think he has his lectures on the sophist and things like that. He's, he's plenty of plenty of that. So before we jump into Descartes, uh, what are the four views of reality? So monism, pluralism, materialism, idealism. It's a lot of isms. Just give us the kind of yeah, yeah. broad brushstrokes because then that will help us as we get into other stuff. What, what, are, what are these and, and how do how have we come to them and why are they kind of important, these four different ways of viewing it? Yeah, so uh, the first view is monism. And if you think about Parmenides uh, and the way he's taken up and he sees that everything is one, um, but um, the problem with monism is that as soon as you say that, that being is one, you've got a multiplicity of terms already. As soon as you begin to speak, there's like this, uh, um, to make claims about reality, you, 
you have this um, plethora of terms, and then how do you relate them? Because um, you're already using the copula is to say that being is one, and you've got this one, and you've got being, and then you've got this other being that's linking these two terms together. And I think um, the problem with monism is that you can't, each one of those things is. Mm -hmm. So it can't, they, each one can't be the totality. There seems to be something uh, outside of that. And that's a problem of the horizon. Um, the other view is like something with Empedocles uh, pluralism, where, you know, everything is uh, uh, love and strife, or, you know, everything is fire, everything is water. Uh, got these four elements uh, uh, together. Um, but each of those things is. And so it gestures to something uh, that links all of them together. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got uh, materialism, which you know he equates with the giants who think that they can grasp everything with their hands, reaching down and grabbing earth and rocks and trees. And uh, uh, Plato's uh, completely against this because he's obviously wants to make a case for a kind of idealism, which is the other view of reality, the friend of the forms, that there are these independent um, paradigms of everything that exists, uh, and that the wise person knows that. Uh, and, and then, you know, when you think about the different um, um, motion and sameness and difference that he articulates later in the dialogue, he's really uh, trying to bring all of these views of reality together in his own uh, approach to reality, which is that reality has this ideal uh, form um, uh, that we grasp with our ideas, and that the philosopher can look to these forms as a kind of blueprint, like the demiurge, you know, who looks mm -hmm. to the forms and then creates. But instead of creating a world, we create language. And this is the distinction that comes out in the sophist between the philosopher and the sophist. The philosopher looks to the forms and tries to create a likeness in language as close as possible. Whereas the sophist doesn't look to the forms. There is just an attempt to appeal to an audience and whatever appearances will sell, they're happy to provide. Uh, and this is the distinction in the book that I make between Han van Meegeren and Johannes Vermeer. Uh, Han van Meegeren forges paintings, not of existing Vermeers, but of Vermeer paintings of biblical scenes that historians thought might exist, but have never been discovered. And he paints them and he gets them, to, convinces them that they are true Vermeers. Mm -hmm. But in fact, Vermeer used, and, and it's Philip Stedman's book that Vermeer's camera uh, points us out, but it, it's clear that the scale in Vermeer's paintings suggests that he knew about 17th century optics and those early camera obscurus and that he would build in the back of the room a box with mirrors and uh, pinholes to project the room onto a canvas so that he could then preserve the scale. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the philosopher and Vermeer, it's like using the camera obscura to try to look to the real, the reality of things and then paint as close as you can to the likeness of reality. Mm -hmm. That's what Plato, I think, aspires to in this dialogue, is that the philosopher should be trying to represent reality in language mm -hmm. as best he can, whereas the sophist doesn't think you can know reality and so just does whatever the, will please the audience or whatever will advance his interests or the interests of the person who's paying. It. Yeah, no, that's, 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 that's a wonderful way of putting it. Uh, I, I find that maybe Plato's approach is is in a good way very aspirational that's what we should shoot for right but we probably are going to get to the sophist <laughs> and it's you know, interesting that the dialogue ends that way too right right, right. Yeah. you see the two together and you're like still not really clear mm -hmm. who's a philosopher and who's a sophist they seem to share some qualities right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, okay, so let's go to uh, Descartes. So, um, obviously, way forward in time, right? Uh, he's you know, a big, big, big jump. Uh, there's a lot of people in there in between. 
but Descartes does this interesting uh, thing where he says that there's these substances, right? And there's the infinite substance, which he calls God. And then there's the bodies and minds, which are finite, right? They're not infinite. Um, and so I guess there's a few questions here. What is he... How does he define, I guess, God in that way, right? You know, he's, is he, you know, is, is it like the Judeo-Christian personal God? Um, or is he trying to see, you know, this label of God as an abstraction for an infinite substance? I think of, um, there's another philosopher that does this. Um, it will come to me, I'm drawing a blank. Um, and then how is this different from like Aristotle using substances? So just talk about like how he makes this kind of idea between infinite and finite substances juxtaposed with, you know, kind of Aristotle does it uh, and, and why he has this kind of religious topspin of, you know, labeling it God or things yeah. like that. Well, maybe we can talk about the first, the two definitions, Aristotle's definition of substances, uh, a substance is that which is uh -huh. uh, um, receives predicates, but, of itself is not predicated of anything, mm -hmm. right? Um, Descartes' definition has to do with contingency, uh, uh, and that is that a thing, uh, a substance is a thing that doesn't depend on anything else. Mm. And so uh, it's not just that it can't be predicated of something else in, in a logical way, which is, which is Aristotle's position, but this is more of an ontological uh, and metaphysical claim about substances. Mm. So uh, what it means to be a substance is to not depend on anything else. And for Descartes, there's only one thing uh, like that in the world, and that would have to be God. And in the meditations, he says, you know, in the opening, he says what he wants to do is prove that there is a God <clears throat> and that there is a soul, and he wants to do it by philosophy, not by theology. Mm. So he wants to do it by reason alone. And so he sets that tone early. Mm. I mean, again, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty high bar. He thinks he does it. Uh, the objections that he received to the uh, uh, um, uh, meditations suggest that he didn't even come close. Uh, and some people have even suggested that he's not very serious about it. I, I take him to be serious. I think he was, um, he was a Catholic till he died. Uh, he was, uh, as I point out in the book, I mean, he... Uh, went to uh, a Jesuit uh, college and uh, would have had to have participated in the meditative practices. And it's not strange that he writes meditations. Um, there is some Stoic influence there, but there's also the Catholic influence of mm. Loyola. Um, and so I think he's, uh, I think he is a religious thinker who wants religion to be rational and scientific. I think he wants to show it to be so. And, and that's why he understands substance in that way. And of course, Spinoza, you know, will, will read Descartes and then say, yes, but there can only be one substance and everything else simply has to be a dynamic expression of that one substance, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, um, it, for, the, for the real kind of materialist, spirituality you have to get spinoza after mm -hmm. descartes he really mm -hmm. purges i think probably descartes of his, all of his spirituality mm -hmm. yeah descartes had this idea of methodological doubt and what he you know, called the cogito right so how do you describe this how do you how do, how do we understand this yeah i mean what I, I call it methodological because he he is aware of skepticism of his day He's aware of the ancient skeptics, you know, who would reduce every argument to either a circular argument or a reductio ad absurdum. Mm -hmm. And for him, that's, that's like uh, uh, Jan Martell in The Life of Pi says, uh, you know, uh, regarding atheism, he says choosing atheism is like choosing immobility as a means of transportation, right? It doesn't work. And so I think for Descartes, skepticism you know, as a philosophical method is like, you know, choosing immobility as a means of transportation. It's, it's not going to get you anywhere. But what methodological doubt does is clear away um, things that we cannot know for certain. And this is his attempt in the beginning, is to first deny everything that the senses give us, not because they lie, 
he doesn't think that later on he's going to bring the senses back in. But he says, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't give us an accurate account. I put a stick in water, it looks bent. Uh, I see something afar off, it looks small, but the closer I get, it's larger. So they don't give us an accurate picture. So let's set them aside for now because they admit of some doubt. And then the imagination, which he says is turned towards the body um, and therefore turned towards the senses, can also lead us astray because he realized that the, the imagination is really powerful, you know, but it also has limits. I can't uh, imagine a chilagon, right? Uh, because I, I have never experienced that, but I can, I can imagine a phoenix, right? And, and if I describe a phoenix to you right now, Xavier, and say, you know, it's this large gray animal with big floppy ears and a long nose, you will tell me, that is not a phoenix. And I will say, how do you know? You've never seen a phoenix, right? But we, we have this idea of a phoenix that has all these constitutive features that we've imagined, but they can be terribly wrong. So he sets aside the imagination too. And then as a kind of coup de grace, he says, what if there is some super intelligence that is vicious and just wants me each time I think uh, something that it it is making me think in error, or is I think two plus two equals four, but maybe that's just because this higher being that is an evil genius is is making me think that. And he does that because he thinks that if there is something like that that is manipulating his mind, then he won't be able to trust anything that he has known or has thought. Because he thinks there has to be something else that is absolutely certain that he can use as a foundation for everything else. And even if there is an evil genius, if he finds something else that's more stable and certain, then he will have a foundation for knowledge. And then he finds that in the second meditation. And he says, even if I accept all of those things, I don't, I don't know if I have a body, I can't trust any of my senses. Uh, I can't trust my imagination, and maybe even my mind is being uh, um, uh, manipulated by an evil genius. If I'm doubting, that's an act of thinking. Mm -hmm. And this thinking means that I exist. Even if I'm thinking erroneously, I exist. And so his existence for him becomes the fundamental truth that is certain. And he thinks from there he can deduce that there must be a God, that this God uh, uh, can be trusted because he has to be perfect. Um, and he's providing the ideas in his mind, geometrical and mathematical ideas that then allow him to um, make sense of and render intelligible his ex sensory experiences of the world. And so everything he takes away in the first meditation, he gives back by the end of the sixth meditation. And so most people only read the first two uh, meditations and they come away saying, he's a skeptic. He doesn't think the external world exists. He doesn't think he exists. <laughs> this is precisely not his project, right? Mm -hmm. His project is to show not only do I exist, but the world exists and we can do science mm -hmm. and mathematics and geometry are going to be the means of doing that. If we follow the scientific method, we will use our judgment correctly and we will come to the truth about things. Yeah, so many people have made, so what he finds, right, is that, you know, cogito ergo sum, right? I think, therefore I am. That's like his big claim to fame. But most people, people have different ideas about what this really means or what it is. Is it uh, some idea, I mean, again, it depends on who you ask, but it wasn't just a fact of, like, you can think about yourself erroneously, but the fact that you are able to do that, it's just you know, metacognition is what we call it now. It's a theory of mind. It's things we, we, we understand, from other labels we put on this kind of idea. But is it the fact that it's... <laughs> is, is it the phenomenology of understanding one's Dasein that you're able to do that, right? Or is it more of this consciousness thing? Or how do we best understand what he was doing there with the, the consciousness? Well, I mean, what he's trying to do is prove that there's a soul by way of this description of his own inner experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
The problem with the cogito is that he assumes an I, and this is partly Kant's critique of him later on. This Kant will say, you know, the, this I think, therefore I am, is a paralogism. It's a, it's a logical error. He assumes there to be an I and suggests that it's a substance, but he doesn't know that. It's like trying to look at the back of your head, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have any real uh, experience of your I. You assume your I. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think what's even more interesting from a phenomenological perspective is that how does Descartes get to I mm -hmm. without a body? Mm -hmm. Because in the first meditation, he's denied all the senses. Yeah. And what we know phenomenologically, you know, from Hegel and others, is that the way I demarcate myself is through my physical proximity to things that are not me. So my, the edges of my body are the limit of me and the beginning of everything else. And without some embodied existence, I don't get to an eye. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a problem with, with his initial foundation. It may be that he exists. Right. And Kant thinks, yes, there's a transcendental subject. You can't you have to assume it to do anything, of course. But the idea that you've you've apprehended apodictically a thinking substance that can then become the certain foundation, uh, Kant and others. And I agree. It, he hasn't accomplished that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I mean, anytime I think of the body, you know, I, I or embodiment, I, I just always just kind of like automatically, it's hard for me not to think of Merleau Ponty because he talks so much about how we are to be human is through the body, right? And he went so far as to say, even like, I mean, say it this way, but even if you were to upload our consciousness, let's say, right, onto a, a server somewhere, right, you still, it still wouldn't be you because the body is an essential feature of that. And, and so kind of to the same place with this understanding of the I, how do you, there's too many assumptions that are made within that to say that. And one of them would be the body, which is, um, which is extremely important it, you obviously don't want to overemphasize it but you don't want to assume it or de-emphasize or underemphasize the utility of the body in understanding one's being and uh so i think that that's you know kind of a what what many people after him have kind of uh picked on him about <laughs> um okay so so let's talk about um in in terms of descartes because again i, I want to get to all the other 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 main folks so uh, just as a as a kind of summary here, Plato and Descartes, the the folks that you um, chose to discuss about you know this kind of metaphysical question, what is real, what is reality? Um, I guess one one last thing on, with Descartes before we move on to um, epistemology is, you know, he he had this idea of the intellect and the will of the mind, and then also some idea of free will, right? So I usually avoid free will conversations on. The podcast because I just feel like they need their own conversation. I had a, I had Greg Caruso come on a, little, okay. a, a yeah, while yeah. ago, and and you know we we chat about free will for about two hours, and so it was great, right? And you know he's he's very well positioned with all the different arguments, and and um, he had that great book with Dan Dennett about it and all that stuff. So, but but it it will always pop up. It pops up. It has a. Free will has a universality to it. I can remember in seminary, I mean, this was all the rage, you know, people just predestination, you know, being foreknown and, you know, free will and choice and blah, blah, blah. Um, but even if you take out a religious context, people argue about this all the time. You know, do I have free will? Can I know this? Who's pulling the strings? Determinism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But for Descartes, what was his idea of, you know, free will, the will of the mind, the intellect? For him, how was he kind of thinking about these things? Yeah, I, I mean, uh beginning with this idea that I think therefore I am with the cogito, he, he is suggesting that his consciousness is independent of his body. And I think historically, if you situate that against the backdrop uh, uh, of his historical period, what you see is this great eruption of change, the calling into question of church authority, the emergence of scientific, uh, you know, uh, revolutions and Religious wars, right? And, and one response to that is someone like uh, Michel de Montaigne, who you know takes a skeptical approach, right? 
uh, that you know the way out of these kinds of uh, dire um, circumstances and the vicissitudes of life is to let go of our claims uh, to know these things for certain, right? We can't know any religion's true, so let's just be tolerant of everyone. Hmm. Hart, on the other hand, takes, takes a more rationalist approach. He thinks we can know uh, some things uh, for certain, and I think he thinks that what he discovers in himself is this free consciousness that can, can think independently of a world gone mad in some way. Uh, so I think he he does have um, perhaps the stoic idea of a free uh, intellect um, and that the will is a sort of secret sauce that you can then, if you use your judgment correctly, right, and, you, and you're following the scientific method, you can uh, will things within uh, um, rational constraints that will lead to a happy life. Hmm. You know, Stephen Toulmin wrote that great book, Cosmopolis, about Descartes and how, you know, he did have this kind of conception that, the, he, that rationalism and science was going to make a better world. You know, when you look back across the 20th century, back, you, you want to counsel him that maybe it wasn't going to turn out as, as great as he thought. But, you know, that was a belief of his, hmm. you know, and I think he thought we had the freedom intellectual freedom to do that mm, yeah okay so we've we've touched on what we have figured out what is reality uh from plato and descartes so let's move to epistemology uh so how we know and how we know we know uh i think i've said it before i don't remember where or maybe i was on someone else's podcast but <clears throat> so one of my for for a while it's not now but for a while um epistemology was like my favorite form of philosophy. I just love the idea of like, how do we know things? And how do we know we know it? And um, I, I've said it before, I wanted to do philosophy when I was younger and when I was going to school and I, that's what I was thinking I was going to do. And I said, well, I wanted to find something that um, <laughs> was, I didn't want to just teach and write. And so I was like, I like that, but I don't only want to do that. And, um, and so I wanted to take more traditional things. And then I wanted to do more you know, practical stuff and working with people more and understanding that. And so that was my gateway to, uh, <laughs> to psychology. And so I've never looked back since, but, uh, I, it actually does start with, uh, epistemology. I really, really, really enjoy that. So we can, we can talk about the two heavy hitters here, Hume and, uh, Kant. So let's start with Kant. Um, is he an empiricist? Is it, would, would you would you say this? He's an empiricist, and and if so, is he a relativist? How do you kind of just situate where he fits in terms of how we can understand well, sorry, him? Hume or Kant? With, with Hume. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, with Hume. Uh, yeah, yeah, Hume. Yeah, he he's an empiricist, and the, the way I um, the way I read him is uh, in large part as a result of uh, Deleuze's Empiricism and Subjectivity book in which he kind of gives a psychological uh, interpretation of Hume, that the question for Hume is how does experience become a mind? And uh -huh. what always struck me in the treaties uh, with Hume is his, his idea that we don't have a self that our self is just this bundle of impressions and that uh, I love that criticism of Descartes there, that when I go into myself, if I follow you, Descartes, all the way down the path that you followed, what I find is not a substance. I don't find a thinking substance. What I find is heat and anger and joy and all these internal impressions, but I don't find a unified subject. Yeah, there's nobody inside of us pulling the strings and the levers. There's no one driving the car here. Rather, it's the amalgamation of all of our experiences or all of our different various aspects of how we, you know, interact with others or in different environments. That makes the the total self, if you will, the global self, if you will, as opposed to there's a, you know, there, it's like a Russian doll or whatever. There's like something inside the very interior and then it's all outward from that. Hit, that's really his thing, right? It's like the self is an illusion of sorts. Exactly. And, and, but then there is a self for him, but it's this effective response to impressions, right? Or a reflective response uh, to the affections that we experience. Mm. And um, yeah, so I, 
I, I read him as an empiricist, uh, in, and in the book, I position him against Descartes, and I show how, you know, he's um, dismantling this rationalist kind of philosophy, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's that will be important for Kant because Kant is in the grips of what he calls dogmatic slumber, but this rationalist certitude um, that comes out of Leibniz, uh, you know, for him, uh, but. This is where Kant gets awakened and he's like, oh my God, yeah, this uh, Hume is right. Like, where do I get these ideas? Mm-hmm. They're not innate in me. Yeah. Right? yeah. Because, you know, one, one, of, one of Hume's great analogies is like, if, if you were to take the, you know, the biblical Adam and take him to some water and he'd never seen the water before, nothing about the water would suggest to him that he would drown in it. Nothing about mm-hmm. the, uh, transparency or its uh, fluidity, none of that would suggest that he would drown. So he has to, you have to have the impression first to get the idea. Without an impression, you don't have an idea for, for Hume. And so all of our knowledge about reality is going to begin in our sensory experience. And then there is the way in which we begin to reflect and, and, and construct these ideas on the basis of that. And he comes up, I, I think, with an important epistemological principle, which is if you have an idea in your mind, you, to verify that idea, you need to bring it back into your sensory experience. Mm-hmm. You need to determine what is the connection between my idea and my experience. So if I think apples are red uh, and I have an idea of red apples, I need to go back into my experience and see if I can find sensorially apples that are red and when i do i can say okay um uh, that may be a matter of fact (laughs) that i can now say i have seen with my senses red apples then i go to the grocery store and realize that there are yellow and green apples as well Mm -hmm. Uh, and so uh then i can expand my idea of apple Mm -hmm. Um, but without those sensory experiences i don't have that yeah it reminds me back to what we were saying earlier of you know taking the apple for example i know um merlin ponty and jean paul sartre they they talk about this stuff too in a different way but you know there's something of what it what it is to be an apple right in this scenario and so everything our mind is is and even how we have intelligence is you know it's like a program right it's a system and we're we're, we're confirming denying it we're trying to fit it into this, this program we have of things and there's something about the collection of, uh, you know, atoms and particles that make up the atom or, or the, the apple, excuse me. And there's, you know, we know through, you know, biology and botany and all these things, what it is about it that gives it its shape and gives it its color. And we call it red. It, it does. It isn't actually red objectively, right? It, it, that's what we call it. And so we know it that way, right? Now, but, but there's, again, right? It's a, almost a type of, you know, through language, a label of the thing that is, right? There is a, a coating of sorts of a, of a shade, of a color. Now, that could be different for, for example, again, this goes back to like the whole reality thing, right? I'm still stuck on that, right? I'm like perseverative today on this. <laughs> is... You know, for, for like my dog, or for, if I have a dog or for my cats, they can't see color. That doesn't, but that doesn't mean that it actually isn't there. And there are many things for us through our senses in our body that we also can't see. There's animals that have like infrared and stuff like that. The, the world looks so different for them. Yeah. And there are things that, that, you know, they would, I mean, they don't have, as far as you know, language or how they do these things. I mean, they communicate, but, but we don't have something like that. You know, there's so many things we can't see or know, even though it exists in our material world, right? And so I, I guess for, for Hume, it, there's this idea of how do you have these kinds of copies of these impressions, right? How do you understand these types of things? And, and as opposed to just having these kind of innate ideas, which I guess Descartes and others have, have, have postulated. Yeah, and, uh, and the way he does that, uh, this gets to those the, those principles of atomism and associationism. But atomism is this, uh, and, and these both interpretations, concepts come out of uh, Deleuze's reading of Hume. But uh, atomism is this is this idea that Hume has that that reality is not a unified whole, mm. 
And, it, and it's not a substance that we're going to know. It's this multiplicity of material uh, particles, atoms that are affecting us. Mm -hmm. And what happens when they begin to affect us is the imagination sort of bundles them and represents them. And then there is this activity of associationism, which is the epistemological uh, principle that begins to associate them together because they're next to each other, they're contiguous, or they're like each other, but it bundles them together in these associations and begin. And then when you see these things over and over again, like every time I see an apple, they're red and they're sweet and they're round. And so each time I see a red, sweet, round thing, or everything that has all of those constitutive features, I say, yes, this is an apple. I can make that kind of affirmation. Now, I may, it may turn out to be uh, a plastic apple, right? But then it wouldn't be sweet necessarily. But, right, right, right. Uh, but those ideas are helpful practically for coping in the world. But Hume thinks that we come to those ideas because we habitually see them and we mm -hmm. take them as matters of fact that they will be this way tomorrow. Apples will still be red and sweet and round tomorrow because I've habitually seen them that way. But what he points out is that that's, always, that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. We say the sun will rise tomorrow, never mind that it doesn't rise. But that will it will be there in the sky tomorrow. But it might not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it most certainly will have a a, a shelf life. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. it's not going to be there. And, and so there, in his epistemology, there is this kind of skepticism or an mm -hmm. open experimental way of approaching what we can know. He does think there are things we can know for sure. There are relations of ideas that are apodictically certain. Uh, but there is a lot of things that we have kind of seen as foundational that are in fact matters of fact. And there are also illusions that he thinks um, have led us into speculative philosophy that we can't justify. And um, instead of uh, making us happier uh, and more wise, it, it's made us delusional. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he wants to purge philosophy and demystify it uh, in, in many ways, um, and, uh, and return us to our bodies in the world to make mm. us more skeptical and experimental. In our, in our mm. yeah. I want to, I want to ask about the sentiments, <clears throat> um, mm -hmm. because many people will see this as a kind of precursor. Well, you know, other people have talked about it sort of in similar, but as a precursor to feelings, what we call feelings. Now I've, I've talked to plenty of folks that do emotional theory and things like that on podcasts and researchers and stuff. And, you know, I, I think if you're, if you're, if you're in a particular field, um, and you just, you, you really only have the scientific method. Well, that's a, to me, that's, that's a tool, but it's, I, in, in my view, you need to, kind of do philosophy before as a framework to then use the, the tool of the scientific method. And some people don't do that. Some people do. I talked to Owen Flanagan. And, and so he's kind of in both worlds on this, right? So that was fun, right? We were talking about, you know, uh, different emotions and stuff. And, um, but how for, for Hume are, are, well, let me ask it this way. What would he define as the sentiments and how is that similar to what we understand as emotions or feelings um, or affect? Those are all three different things, but similar. But, you know, how do we map it onto that um, from his idea of the sentiments? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd be, I'm not a Hume expert. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'll be speculating here. But my understanding, uh, the way he sees feelings is, in many ways, a contradiction in contradistinction to the way Plato understood them, right? For Plato, those were irrational, mm. and they need to be brought under the tutelage of reason, mm. uh, because reason can educate the desires and educate feelings and organize our life in a, in a happy way or, or, or a rational way so that we will be happy. Mm. For Hume, he thinks that, um, that our will is actually influenced by our feelings, not by our reasons. And, and so we have to take account of the way we feel about things. And he thinks a lot of those feelings come about through custom, 
mm-hmm. through the way we're situated in our communities and the habits that we pick up. Um, but I think that's an interesting insight because it, it foregrounds affect mm-hmm. and the way the world is affecting us and the way we are constituted as the result of these sentiments that are formed in us. And I think that's Deleuze's insight into Hume too, is that he noticed that Hume was trying to figure out how does affect become a mind and then how does a mind become a subject? Because if you, if you think about that kind of, um, that's a very materialist kind of, of psychology there, right? That we are being shaped and conditioned by our uh, environment, but we're also conditioning it, right? It, it's back and forth. This is an insight in Arendt too, that we are these conditioned, conditioning beings. There's a role of sentiment and affect uh, that plays a role in how we understand ourselves and how we're constituted mm-hmm. uh, in the world. Yes. It, it- there is there is so much this is why again i mean uh, <clears throat> i don't know it's it's a there's a there's a meta kind of way of looking at this with this phenomenon where people really like these kind of dichotomies of sorts right if you're 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 in the genetic determinism and this is how we're created and you know or whatever right this is how we're formed or whatever whatever and and then other people are like, no, it's all the environment and social construction and oh my goodness, you know, all this stuff. And the fact is, is that both are true, but it really, it's, it's not even a matter of are both true, right? It's a matter of how are, how, what is the, the interaction and the relationship between many things that are kind of set by genetics that are set by our, our, um, our biology but then you're doing it in environments and you're doing it within certain uh, kinds of contexts. But that, so that's influencing you. So there's the input you receive from the world around you, but then there's the output that you're giving, right? And there's this, like always this discussion that's going on, you know, not really, but there's discussion that's going on, which again, right, is, you know, how are we understanding, you know, being in the world, right? Against that backdrop of worldhood, right and the different iterations of that and it's it's there's an intersubjectivity to that that's going on sometimes many times we're conscious of it most times we're unconscious of it it doesn't matter i mean sometimes it does but it doesn't really matter is it's always an interaction there's always a, a, a whether you're thinking about it or you're intentionally trying to do it or not and and that's informing informing us so i agree with you know kind of arnt's perspective is that there there is that kind of uh, um you know bilateral way of, of, of doing things. Uh, one question I have is, is about the, so this is again, a little bit kind of, uh, um, broader here, but many people, uh, talk about Aristotle's four causes. This comes up a lot, right? Now (laughs) I'm going to, I'm going to try and be very careful here. Um, if, if my, if my buddy Stephen Klaus uh, listens back to this, you know he's like the Aristotle person, right? He just, you know, he's he's devoted his entire, pretty much adulthood to Aristotle. So, um, but he has said, and other people have said that, you know, there's a way in which Aristotle meant his four causes. So, how do you understand Aristotle's four causes, and then how does Hume disagree with his four causes? Yeah, I mean. Uh... Aristotle had uh, thought that you could understand anything by understanding its causes. And remember, in the metaphysics, he says all human beings by nature desire to know, and and what they desire to know are the causes of things. And so he said there could be, um, you know, there's a a formal cause of something, uh, which is its design, uh, the way uh, the matter the material cause is formed and there is an efficient cause that brings that matter into the form that it's in. And then there is the um, final cause, which is the uh, purpose for which the thing is. And so what you have there, which is interesting in this, in this causal analysis is a connection between the formal cause that gives rise to a set of functions that then indicates its purpose. It's tell us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so one example of, of this Aristotelian cause analysis that I like to use is of a poem. So 
the poet is the efficient cause and the material cause is the language and the formal cause is the rhyme scheme. And then you could say, if there's a purpose to a poem, that it is to, uh, you know, enjoy or to, to please or to illuminate in some way. Um, and so Aristotle thought you could describe everything like this because everything in the universe was, was causal. There was a prime uh, mover and everything else followed this kind of uh, causal teleological end. I mean, his physics is not good. So <laughs> there's some question about whether or not you can continue to apply those four causes for analytical purposes. Um, but for Hume, um, we can't have any knowledge of causes. Uh, causes are inferences of the mind. Uh, now, if, if Aristotle wanted to concede and say, look, I'm not saying these things are natural to things. I'm saying that I'm inferring this causal structure, then Hume would agree, right? But we don't have any sense of cause. And his, uh, Hume's example is the billiard example where, you know, you see uh, a cue ball moving towards an eight ball on the table and they come in close proximity and then you see the eight ball move uh, and you infer that the cue ball caused the eight ball to move because it, it struck it. But you have no empirical sensory experience of the transfer of kinetic energy from one ball to the other. Mm -hmm. What you do is say, each time I've ever seen a ball move towards another one, a stationary ball, the second one usually moves and by habit of mind, I, I'm inferring that the first ball caused the second one to move. You may be right, Hume says, but you don't have any empirical proof to make that inference. You may have to do it for practical purposes, and that's fine, he says, but you don't have the kind of knowledge that Aristotle says we have. Yeah, I think the counter to that would be, well, not everything's empirical. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. That would be the counter, which may or may not be true, but that becomes very, you're starting to branch out in, you know, waters that are very, you know, you know, unforeseen. Like you just don't, you, it's very hard to say like, yeah, sure. But it's, it's hard to kind of really, really know it. So I guess I, I want <laughs> to, I'll, I'll ask you this, right? If you want to make a, a, a pitch on, we talked about free will and, and Hume uh, does not believe in free will, I believe, is, is, is at least in the deterministic he's way. He's a compatibilist. The yeah. compatibilist, yeah. He's a Dan Dennett guy. <laughs> right. Um, uh, so you can briefly talk about that. I don't know if you want to talk about his views on racial naturalism. Uh, this is kind of controversial, but um, he, but his, his ideas about that as well. I mean, not controversial, they're wrong. <laughs> well, yes, 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 yes. But I don't know if you want to spend time on it or not. But maybe just kind of give the compatibilist idea of of uh, Hume's kind of free will idea. You know, compatibilism is a popular uh, or, yeah, it's a popular and kind of main idea of free will. And then just kind of say why he's very wrong on racial naturalism. <laughs> yeah, so he thinks that necessity and freedom, or what he calls liberty, are, are compatible because every choice that we make requires prior knowledge and causes and conditions for the choice to even be available to us to make. And therefore, he thinks every free choice that we make is preceded by causes that we can't change. And therefore, we must be both free and determined in some way. So one example, I, which I give in the book is that if I'm reading the New York Times, and I learn about the Pergamon Museum, uh, which I never knew about, then suddenly I have a desire to go there. So it's the knowledge of the museum existing, and then suddenly this desire, which have causal influence on the choices I will make. And now I realize that can't just be there. I have to get my passport in order. I have to book a flight. Uh, all these other causes and conditions have to be there before I can freely choose to walk into this museum uh, and enjoy it. And so uh, he's, he's trying to uh, highlight the fact that human beings are part of nature and nature follows necessary causal laws much that we can't know about, but we're situated within that. And so we shouldn't understand ourselves to have some kind of sui generis free will that's not influenced by any causes and conditions. So uh, he thinks we're influenced by that. And, and if you go back to the theory of affects 
and sentiments. I mean, um, if we're being conditioned by the world in which we're embedded, these affects have causal force on the kinds of choices and the ideas that we have. Um, and then our actions are going to be influenced uh, by that. So how free really are we? Yeah, I mean, we're not, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't believe in free will. So I, I think that there's, you know, I mean, look, I mean, I've said it before, right? And other people have said it too, you know, I don't know the next, I don't know how I'm going to, in this sentence, I don't know what the next sentence is going to be. I don't know which thoughts are going to rise to consciousness. And, and, and you know, I'm not going to be able to know um, where things arise from in any given moment. Now, I, now, for example, right, I can choose to go to this museum in another place, right? Choose, quote unquote. But the idea is coming from somewhere. And I don't choose the ideas to pop into consciousness. Like, boom, okay, I want to go there. Right now, I can obviously be influenced by things, of course, but there is a and, and, and look, you can if you take the Freudian way, we have many things in unconscious in our unconscious state that are <laughs> a type of repository of all of our other experiences, our past experiences, right, which I think is true. But we don't at that moment know. And we don't know where it's coming from. We don't know why that's right. You know, you'll have a thought about when you were seven and a certain memory. And it's like, why am I thinking about that? I have no idea. And you can't control whether you have that thought, right? Um, now, people use, again, like most things, right? They can abuse this kind of way of thinking. It's like, well, I just had this urge, so I did it. I don't really have any choice over it. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> you may not have a choice over the urge, but what you do or the behaviors or the actions you take, yes, you, you do have some way of choosing not to continue with that urge or choosing not to have, you know, continue with that line of thinking, you know, choose how to manage your feelings and emotions. You know, the words are maybe not the best, but the facts that you have them come to consciousness, you don't choose that and you cannot choose that. I think it's a a really hard argument to make one that I haven't heard too well of how that happened. How can you, how can, that's not, that's not free will. You can't, you're not choosing those things. Right. And so I think it's I, the compatibilist kind of approach is just, they start flipping around words and defining it differently. And then they, you know, it, it becomes like, okay, so what are we really talking about then? You know, <laughs> right. Are we talking about the same thing now? Or are we just like changing something, you know, and defining it differently? Uh, I guess on the racial naturalism, what do you want to say about that? Yeah. I mean, in his, you know, infamous, uh, footnote, um, he in, it suggests that there are, people uh, who have more melanin than other people, and that this suggests that they have uh, lesser qualities and lesser uh, capacities than other human beings. And it, it's, it's, you know, sad because if you take his view that all of our ideas come from our impressions, and that our, our epistemological task is to take ideas and trace them back to their, uh, and try to empirically verify them in our experience, mm -hmm. then he seems to have in place a way to inoculate himself mm -hmm. from such a pernicious mm -hmm. uh, view of races. Now, he's influenced by all the race talk in in, in his period, right? Yeah, I was going to ask how much of this was influenced by the time and who was around and all that stuff, you know? I mean, obviously, you don't really know, but, you know, what was around? Francois Bernier, I think, is the first one to use it. He's a mm -hmm. physician. Uh, the, the category of race is used to categorize certain people. And that, you know, if, if you read all of these early racial theorists, there's three kinds of races and mm -hmm. then there's six and then there's nine and you know it, mm -hmm. they're not really clear on how many there are but it's used as a kind of anthropological tool to categorize all these different people that are coming in but it's also a justification for the subordination of people from other nations 
Right. And see, that's see, that's the split, right? I can be okay with, hey, look, at the time, folks didn't know, you know, what we know now, obviously, right, with, you know, genetics and DNA and how we understand different things. Fine, 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 fine. So if you're trying to categorize things or, or folks, right, you're categorizing them by, you know, a, a, a region or, you know, I think it's odd to categorize people by skin color, but okay, like, you're, I could understand the attempt at trying to create some type of taxonomy. I, I'm, I'm, I can respect that at the time with whatever knowledge they have, fine. That the, then it's the leap to, well, these are inferior and these are superior. It's like, well, wait, wait a minute. What? That doesn't, why would you make that leap based on an arbitrary categorization and what you just said? You have a way to, to work against that. And you're not even, you know, using that free pass that you have to say, oh, well, wait a minute. My own idea says this. So that can't be true. That's where it starts to be like, hmm, well, what is going on there? The first assumption would be this person's a racist bigot. Uh, maybe not, but probably yes. <laughs> right? right. I mean, I mean, part of what racial naturalism argues is that there are these racial essences. That mm -hmm. is, that there is this substantial core to this being mm -hmm. that you know because of their phenotypical differences of skin yeah. color or hair or whatever. He's already denied that we can know the substance of anything, right. even bread. So right. on what grounds do you make the claim that this high level of melanin in someone's skin is suggestive of this, yeah. of this inferior substance when you've already denied that? So it, yeah. it's troubling um, in Hume that he makes this error, uh, much like uh, Kant mm -hmm. as well, right? Mm -hmm. Hegel, uh, I mean, Heidegger, I mean, it, mm -hmm. like... Lots of people have this, uh, um, you know, error that they fall into. And but for Hume, he had he had all the epistemological tools available to him that he had developed to avoid this, mm -hmm. uh, and and he did so. Yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is. It is unfortunate because, sadly, and this is true with everyone you just listed after that, people will take that and say, "You see, I can't listen to anything this guy says." And it's like, look, I get it. Like, these are really, you know, repugnant views that one has of your fellow human. And yet, um, <laughs> people are really complicated. It doesn't invalidate the contribution that their other ideas have towards things like epistemology. And we, and even if, even if, even if all of those, you know, everything that w the person was saying was horrible, right? It doesn't mean you shouldn't study it, I don't think, or you shouldn't know about it, or you shouldn't, you know, I think, I think uh, sanitizing the world in that way or making uh, corrective history doesn't really help anyone because then we're just going to fall in the same holes, you know, in the future. But it is, it is tough, right? Because it causes, it's, it's hard for people to um, really, you know, sit with that. And uh, I, I get very frustrated with people when they try to make things so concrete. You know, it's like, yeah, it's not that way. We, we develop out of that, out of childhood. We don't need to be concrete about people when we're 40. Like we can do that when we're six. Cool. But now when we're 40, people are complicated. You don't have to condone those behaviors or those actions or, 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 you know, even subscribe moral attributions. You may, that may be justified, but even if that is the case, there are folks that can still make other contributions in other areas and but you know this stuff case by case is really challenging and and, and tricky so i mean it, it's, it's, it definitely definitely doesn't make me feel comfortable and i know it makes many other people very uncomfortable but um okay real quick let's just talk about kant briefly um uh gabriel Gottlieb was on a few episodes back and he, fantastic. he yeah, 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 Gabe's fantastic and he's brilliant and um, he likes Fichte a little bit. Did you notice that? He likes, he like just a little bit, just, just, just That's a little bit. I'm hearing of that. <laughs> right. Um, but we actually, that conversation, it was a wonderfully long conversation. I loved every minute of it. Um, we talked about Kant for a very long time, uh, which kind of was sort of planned, sort of not. I, I, we, we were planning on talking about him, but just not like an hour and a half. So, um, and he explained many of these uh, uh, concepts, so we won't, I don't want to be too redundant, but just 
briefly the overview of Kant because he's a monumental figure in um, um, in philosophy, but just in in terms of impact for so many other disciplines we have today, and like his views were were super influential. Uh, he talks about two things, um, a priori, a posteriori. Uh, what are those? And maybe an example of, of each of those. Yeah, uh, for Kant, the, uh, those are sources of our knowledge. So we have a priori knowledge, which is prior to experience. Um, and a posteriori knowledge is uh, knowledge we have that's expanded by um, experiential knowledge that we have. So for example, uh, an, an example of an a priori um, proposition would be all bachelors are unmarried men. Um, this proposition, the uh, predicate is contained in the subject. That is when I say bachelor, I'm already saying male and unmarried. So when I say a batch, all bachelors are unmarried men, I'm just, uh, I'm not expanding our knowledge of bachelor. I'm just reiterating the fact that right. these are male and they're unmarried. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we can know a priori. I don't need to go and interview all the bachelors on the planet to know that they're male and that they're unmarried. But in a posteriori uh, knowledge, um, I expand my knowledge of the subject through my experience. So when I say a proposition like uh, the table is red, well, there's nothing in the constitutive features of being a table that suggests that it might be red. Mm. The tables could be a lot of different colors, but I can have a variety of experiences that show me that uh, there are, in fact, uh, tables can be red. And so I can expand my knowledge of table by having this additional experience. Um, but the big point with, with Kant is that he, he is awakened by Hume's critique of causality. And he says, um, right, uh, I don't have any empirical evidence that there is a cause. However, Hume can't be right that all of my knowledge has to be empirically verified because he said, before I can even get to the pool table to witness those two balls in motion, mm -hmm. something else has to be in place. And this is, I think, the the great revolution in Kant. He wants us to ask, when I have an experience like Hume is uh, discussing, what are the universal and necessary conditions that have to be in place for me to have that experience? Mm -hmm. And so he says, I don't just walk up to a table. There's a whole host of things that are happening, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If I was just, uh, um, as Hume describes, this body that's being bombarded with sensory uh, data, I would go completely mad because there's no way to organize all of that. I, I'm just getting light waves and sound waves and, and gravitational pulls with no way to organize that. So yeah. there must be some framework that has to be in place and it has to be normative for all human beings because we can both approach the pool table from two sides and agree it's a pool table and there are balls there. So he thinks that Fundamentally, what has to be in place is that space and time aren't things that exist in the world. They're, they're transcendentally ideal. Mm -hmm. So space is a, is a framework that provides um, a framework within which objects can appear. Time is this internal framework that allows me to experience objects enduring mm -hmm. uh, over a period of time. But what he also points out is that time also makes it possible for me to count because I can demarcate one thing from another and I can, it's a sequencing kind of framework. And so um, he thinks as soon as we have that in place, then we can say, okay, now I understand how I can see a pool table and balls in motion. Uh, but this has to be a priori. Mm. This isn't, this has to be in place before I have any experience at all. Otherwise it's not intelligible. And so what he, what he does is he synthesizes rationalism and empiricism in his concepts of concepts and intuition by saying intuitions, as Hume wants to emphasize, are blind unless they have some a priori concepts to render them intelligible. 
But concepts, as, as Descartes or Leibniz would want to emphasize, are empty unless they're filled in with our sensory experience, that is, with intuition. And so knowledge isn't going to simply be, as the rationalists would have it, by way of concepts or empirically uh, by way of intuitions. It's knowledge is going to be constituted by conceptually organizing our intuitions. <laughs> for, for, for Kant, this is the genius of him. Right, because of what he's doing. So you mentioned that, that he has this uh, transcendental realism, right? This is, is what he's doing. Just, just talk about that and more of why that concept really set in motion the whole German idealism movement, right? I mean, this is really where you get Fichte, uh, uh, Schelling, and then you know the big, uh, more in vogue now, Hegel. Um, so uh, what, tell us more about the transcendental realism of Kant. Well, not transcendental realism, but transcendental idealism. Idealism, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. yes. So he, what he's doing is saying space and time aren't things in the world. That's, mm -hmm. it's, it's transcendentally, that is, it's a, it's a um, structure of our minds that make possible any experience at all, and without which we can't have any intelligible experience at all. Right. But but then if we begin with our, experience, our sensory experience, there is some object that's affecting me. I, I apprehend the affects of that, and, I, and the imagination begins to bundle it together in what he calls a schema that can then be organized through the concepts of the understanding. Now, he waffles a bit about where the concepts come from, but they're spontaneously produced in, our, in response to our, our sensory experiences. And when we make judgments, and this is how he deduces them, when we make judgments, there's a kind of uh, 12 categories mm -hmm. uh, that he, he borrows from Aristotle and expands that seem to be a table of judgments, logical table of judgments that we always make. And he thinks that every human being has these. And what we know is not the thing in itself, but the appearance as it's organized by those categories. And that's what's ideal. That's the transcendentally ideal notion of knowledge, that we don't ever know things as they are in themselves. So we're not gonna know reality as it is in itself. That doesn't mean we're making it up mm -hmm. because the, the givenness that comes in the intuition is, is part of the material that the categories work upon. And so there is some, um, it's not just subjective knowledge. It's universal and necessary because all human beings have these mm -hmm. uh, categories, but it's also um, making use of the material of our sensory experience. So we can't get beyond that, uh, that ideal uh, knowledge. Or what I, in the book, I even use uh, Deleuze's term of the virtual knowledge mm -hmm. uh, as it appears to us. We can't get beyond that. But that doesn't mean that we don't know things as they are, because we can agree we're all standing in a room or we're all sitting in chairs. The, these are things that we can agree upon because we are organizing our experience in a, in a universal and necessary way. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. I think, um, uh, you know, you, you summarize Kant very well, and, and hopefully listeners will hear kind of you know, really within the context of, of, of many of the major <clears throat> figures we've been talking about just how huge he is for philosophy. And then you can start to see uh, how everyone after him was, was really impacted by his, but it's, it's, it's a, he's a big figure and he's, he's someone that if you think about or do philosophy, you, you, you kind of just have to get him downloaded at some point. Cause he's, 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 a, he's a big, he's a big figure. Yeah. I always recommend it. I mean, uh, I read one time that Carl Jaspers read when he was sick in bed as a, as a 16 year old, he read the entire critique of pure reason. It was just massively impacted by it. Yeah. I can't imagine reading the critique when I was 16. No. Yeah. I oh, think not being sick, but you know, well, yeah, definitely. I was sick. Um, when I was, a when I was an adolescent, I was a big nerd. And so, um, I read, that was my first, uh, foray into, 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 into philosophy. And, and I'm still to this day, a huge believer in reading original source material. The first time you're not going to fucking understand what's going on, but you still should do it. And then you'll get it later and later and later and later to come back to it. 
And uh, yeah, 15, 16, 17 was when I first read uh, John Locke. That's when I read Kant. That's when I read um, a little bit of Hume, Spinoza, uh, all those guys. And that was my first kind of first pass at it. And I was just like, you know, you know, but I remember reading Critique of Pure Reason. I was just blown away. I was just blown away. The, the, the bits I understood, I was like about three fourths of it, I didn't understand. But when I would kind of get it, I was like very slowly, like, wow, like, this person is, is really trying to understand the contours of how we know things and how we know things in reality, but then also mm, not a metaphysical, but a transcendental kind of way of doing it. And so it's, it's, it's an interesting way, you know, to, to get a first pass and then kind of visit it later in life. And so you have experiences, conversations, you start to get a little bit more. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about Nietzsche. I have Great. Um, been, unashamedly uh online and conversations here most people know that um he's he's top of the top of the mountain in terms of philosophy in my mind uh people disagree with that obviously but um he's i think brilliant uh and um tough though he's not tough in a in a way of understanding like you know with kant or heidegger it's like all this like big system and it's like all this like feels like double speak and everything with Nietzsche it's really digestible his aphorisms but it's one of those things where he has completely synthesized entire ideas and concepts and then you have to like really like it's like a thread you just kind of have to pull it and it's like okay I get it and then it's like oh what's here oh oh okay and there's another idea and there's another idea and it's it's you know most of the time people I feel like if you read Nietzsche you'll you'll make a statement and you'll be like, no way, that's absolutely not right. Like, that's ridiculous. And then you read, like, you know, the paragraph that's really long. And you're like, oh, I, yeah, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really get all that when I heard the first two sentences. Yikes. Now I have to go back and rethink. And then I have to, go, it, it's a, it's a process like that when reading Nietzsche usually is, is he's, he's brilliant in that way. Um, so I guess here's my, my first question here. So in the book, you use, you use a deep cut, right? You use like a B side almost, right? <laughs> you use um, you use a essay, um, like an essay, right, of of his um, in a book that is early Nietzsche, early ish Nietzsche, not Birth of Tragedy after that. And I think it's is it just after? After that. it's just after that, right? Yeah, it's before Human All to Human. Um, called the Untimely Meditations. So there are f basically four essays or you know, big meditations, and they're not law. I think the one you use is Schopenhauer as educator, which I think is I don't know, 90 pages maybe. Um, and so I guess my question is why that one? I mean, you could have used, you know, Beyond Good and Evil, uh, The Gay Science, which is probably my favorite, uh, Zarathustra, which that kind of needs to be read as a whole of sorts. But why did you use a that essay and from that uh, kind of deep cut from <laughs> from Nietzsche? I mean, there are two reasons. One, uh, it is uh, it gets to this question of how might we live authentically. I think he gives uh, uh, a good answer to that question that. We live most authentically when we live a creative life, a, a life in which we are perfecting nature in ourselves and in others, making these contributions to culture. Um, but the other reason is, is that he himself, even though he wrote this essay at 29, it was published on his 30th birthday, um, he never disavowed this essay, mm. uh, even though it was written very early. And he's obviously... Uh, uh, not yet at a point where he's ready to disavow Schopenhauer either, right? Does so, he mention this essay in the Echo uh, Homo? I can't um, remember if he does or not. It's been a while since I've read that. I have to look. I don't yeah, know. I know that in, in a letter, he says this essay was a hook for him, for his readers. And huh. that he thought if you read this essay and it resonated with you, then you were one of his readers. And you know, he likes the readers to be, mm -hmm. to ruminate on what he says, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and and this is this is an essay that he really uh, I, I think what you get here in the 29 year old Nietzsche is this lava that's just about to sort of burst. Yeah, that's nice way of putting it. Force 
on the surface. Mm -hmm. And he even uses that language when he talks about Schopenhauer, that there is, you know, there are these thinkers that are full of lava and then they, it turns into this molten cold rock later on. And, uh, but I think here you get that real fire in Nietzsche. And the first section of this essay is to me um, the most helpful to my students because he walks you through one, how you've never heeded the call of conscience to become who you are. He confronts you with that. And then he gives you a process for coming to know yourself that I think is so practical and so helpful without falling back on some kind of essentialist core, like discover your, you know, who you really are and go in search of it. Like find your true self. <laughs> yeah. He says, best of luck with that. And it's yeah, a dangerous right. task, right? Yeah, right, right, right. Um, but he does, he does give you a way um, to discover yourself and to then begin the process of self-cultivation. So mm -hmm. I, this essay, uh, I, it's one of my favorite essays. I come back to it all the time. No. That's, that's great. I, I, I reread it before uh, our conversation it was a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, I mean, I probably read uh, two or three works of Nietzsche every year. I just, I just, all, he's always in rotation. Um, and I hadn't read this one in a while. And I was, and it's just like, there's a weird thing. Mean, it's one of the reasons why he's my favorite is that there's a way in which it, it, it just hits you. And like, it's like, it's like listening to, it's like listening to like a Pink Floyd album or something. It's like, you know, all this or, or Led Zeppelin album. It's like, you know, all the songs, or maybe you know the parts, but like you always hear something new every time. It's just like this timeless, like, how did I not hear? How did I not read that before? I've read this like I mean, eight times. How have I not seen that before? And so that may be the experience and other things you read impact. But there's a there's a Nietzsche is like kind of a philosopher that like has like no bottom to him. It's just like, it, which is. I don't, I don't say that about anybody else. I mean, it's, 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 and especially in the style that he uses, maybe, maybe Aristotle, but Aristotle is a little bit more um, structured in some ways, but it, it just is, it's incredible. So I want to ask about this. This is kind of, the, I have a, I, the main thing I want to focus on here is the self-knowledge, self-education, because that's what he's talking about. And then the cultural piece, I really want to talk about that. And that will be a nice bridge to, to, to Hannah Arndt, but I just a two preliminaries here. <laughs> so, you, you, how do you see Nietzsche as a philosopher of difference? Now, you may get upset at me about this, but how do we avoid the incomplete picture that Deleuze makes about uh, difference? Because he writes about Nietzsche, and I, I've read, it's been a while, but I've read Deleuze on Nietzsche, and I don't, I don't think he's wrong. I'll say that. I don't think Deleuze is wrong about Nietzsche. I just think he is, it's incomplete of how he's seen the difference, right? Um, but just tell me how you think about it, and then you can tell me what you think about Deleuze's angle of it. Yeah, so for me, if I, if I pose the metaphysical question, what is real to Nietzsche, I think his, his answer is life. Life is real. And that what we are, um, naturally and materially, is a complex of drives. And that our task in life is to come to know, first, what we are, this complex of drives. Not a soul, not a self but this natural complex of drives that you then have to, um, uh, you know, as he'll say later in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, you have to uh, become the master of your own life. You know, you have to bring order to the chaos within. So you have to take these drives and you have to find their natural trajectory and then weave them together in a creative way into a work of art. You have to make yourself, right? Um, in contingency, irony, and uh, solidarity, this is Rorty's individualist picture of Nietzsche too, right? The making yourself. <laughs> and um, so uh, w when I talk about self-knowledge, part of what he wants you to see in that first uh, section of the essay is that he asks the useful person to look back on their life and everything they've loved up until now. And what they've loved up until now is what has mastered them and what has elevated their soul, he says. Uh, interesting, he preserves all this kind of religious language in this mm -hmm. early essay too. But he, um, if you if you think about what he's asking there, he's asking you to get on track with your with your desires, with what you want, with with your drives. And then if you follow that out, he says what you're going to find is that there is a kind of cumulative 
development of everything that you've loved and what you will have is the trajectory of your desires and what they aim at are your highest values, what you actually value. And, and once you know these things, I think this is the greatest insight of this. Once you know what your values are, you have a horizon to aim your life at. Mm -hmm. Not something deep inside you, he says, but immeasurably high above you. And once you can aim your life at that, you can, you can take decisions as they come. Well, you know, if you love uh, order and loyalty and harmony, and these are values of you, but you, you take a job where none of these things are present, you will be a miserable human being. You, you should not live a life in conflict with your values. And so once you know yourself, you can, you can educate yourself and, and finally cultivate yourself to then be able to make contributions. That is, that is the highest ideal. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very nice way of putting it. And hopefully when listeners hear that, you know, you just, just, just sit with that. I think that's a good summary. And that's easy to understand, but very difficult to implement. Um, and it takes a lot of responsibility, a lot of uh, in, uh, insightfulness, and a lot of... Uh, I don't want to say it this way because it, 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 there's it, this word is muddied, but there's a lot of vulnerability with yourself to say, I have to find this. I have to figure this out. And that's, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it is like looking into, you know, that dark abyss and like, you know, do you make the plunge? Do you just jump and figure out what it is that, that, you know, no one wants to do that. Right. But that's part of life. That's living life. Right. And the, you said something about the when you find that right this kind of you know self knowledge and stuff and such is based on the values and for Nietzsche the values were not a universalist value system um, given from on high by a deity or you know a head of state or even anyone else consistently it is the values that you you discover and find now that could be the values that do map on to society it, it doesn't mean that it can't be but it means that you have to know it you have to own those values you cannot just adopt them you can't you can't take the um the uh um oh i'm forgetting the uh the um the phrase from Heidegger, yes, where you hide out in the anonymity of, of, of the world or whatever it is, right? And you just, you just adopt what someone else's value system is. You have to uncover that. You have to find that discovery. And that, again, is very, I guess you could say dangerous, but it's, it takes work and it takes a lot of uncertainty. And it's all of these things that will already happen, right? That's already going to happen whether you want to or not. You can hide behind the inauthentic ways of doing things, right? Between what your religion says or your God says or your church says or your society or your culture or your politics or your whatever. You still have, it, it, life won't entirely work unless you're finding and owning and understanding your value system, which many times may be, you know, values that are within a normative, you know, culture where you're at. That's fine. But it's the fact that you confidently can say, yes, this is what I know this is for me. And here's how I know this. Not, well, that's what you do, or that's how it is, or that's, you know, you have to know it. And, and I think that that's the, the you know, that's why for, for Nietzsche, he has such a less of a cerebral kind of way of doing philosophy and more of a visceral way of saying this is a philosophy of life, right? This is a philosophy of of, of true kind of humanism that is about empowering each person and activating the instincts, activating the will, which is this kind of force that, that pushes in everything. And that is a active life. That is a purposeful life. And it all comes from within the person. And that's, there's nothing more, uh, to use you know, probably his language, masterful or strong in that way. Because at the end of the day, if all you have is you, and you're getting all of that from you, obviously you're influenced by other people and experiences, but that's all encapsulated in you, 
you know, that's the, the, the way in which to, as best you can actively live life. And, and to me, I don't, I don't see, um, I'm not, Hannah has elements of this as well, obviously, but the, I don't see another philosopher or thinker so powerfully explaining that in, in that way, right? That to me, that is, that is so beautiful. So anyways, how, how does he show that, I guess, in this essay, you know, he's talking about Schopenhauer, yeah. who he really, you know, uh, respected and I guess somewhat idealized um, for a while. And then he figured out that, you know, half of his stuff was, was not as true as he wanted it to be. And he transcended, I think, Schopenhauer in a lot of ways, because Schopenhauer was kind of mired in a type of nihilism, I guess, or existentialism, but it was, it was pretty cynical. And Nietzsche found some of that dead ends there. But how in this part of his early life did he find, you know, in the essay, how is he describing the kind of uh, self-education piece? So there's the self-knowing, the self-knowledge, but how is the self-education and how is he tie in Schopenhauer here? Yeah, so he... Uh... There's a tension here in the essay. In the beginning, he says, no one can build the bridge uh, for you across which you must cross the river of life, right? right, right. And, and our tendency is to look out into the world. I mean, I, I even hear this in the kind of common uh, self-help literature, you know, like mm -hmm. whatever you want to do with your life, find someone who's already doing it, find out all the things they do, and then sort of emulate them, and you'll wind up in the same place. And Nietzsche would say, no. You, you're going to, somebody else built that bridge and you're going to try to walk on it and end up where they are, but you'll never become you. The price of that ticket is your own life and your own authentic self. And so he says, he's looking at true educators, what he calls true educators. He said, they are your liberators. Mm -hmm. They don't get you to follow them and become like them. Mm -hmm. They awaken you to who you are. Mm -hmm. And then that is how you get on the path to self-education. First, you have the, the self-knowledge. Then you begin to educate yourself, which is to know what your values are and to become, begin trying them on. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go back to those three metamorphoses in, the, um, uh, in Zarathustra, of Zarathustra mm -hmm. right? you come into the world as a camel loaded down with all this baggage from your family and culture and everybody puts it on and you just lumber into the desert. you know. He says, but you gain endurance. You, you become strong underneath the weight of this. But then you become a lion. Everybody does. You become the rebel and you say, you know, uh, all of this baggage has to go. I'm throwing it off. You, you, you know, leave uh, the church. You leave your family. You, you know, you rail against every, he says, ever against thou shalt and thou shalt not. You rail against it, right? But at some point, Every rebel has to face up to the fact that if you only exist because you hate something else, you don't really exist. You're yeah. dependent on the thing that you hate yes. and that you're yes. rebelling against. So, you, yes. so he knows that you have to discover within yourself these, your own values. And then once you do, you become the child, this creative um, free will. <laughs> he he yes. describes it where you're just... Um, you're liberated in some way. And I think what he saw in Schopenhauer was a model of how to come to know yourself, to educate yourself, and then to live consistently with your values. Because when he describes Schopenhauer, he says, this is somebody who was sincere. Mm -hmm. right? They knew who they were, and they weren't going to write for anyone else. Although I, I have to disagree with that assessment. I think, I think Schopenhauer is pretty geared towards his audience, you know, like he <laughs> wanted you to read him in a particular way and Nietzsche kind of emulates that, you know. Um, but I think in this essay, Nietzsche is, is, is trying to say, when you find a true educator, don't become like them. Mm -hmm. Watch how they get on the path of their desires, discover their values and begin to educate themselves and become an authentic human being and follow the Follow that path by building your own bridge across the river of life instead of walking someone else's. Yeah, no, I, 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 I mean that's exactly right. And again, I mean, I think um, Zarathustra is is huge. I mean, it's he said it was his best work. I think most people believe it's his best work. It's it's difficult. Um, 
in many ways, he, you know, he's true to form with his humor. You know, he really kind of emulated it out as like a fifth gospel, right? Which is hilarious. Um, <laughs> but it is, you know, it's like a secular gospel, right? It is, it is in that way. And it's, it's you got so much imagery and things like that, but it is very much that, right? He, cause in the beginning, the, the guy comes down from the mountain and tells, he tells you about these three metaphors and all that stuff. It's, it's wonderful, right? So it's just wonderful. The, the one last thing here on Nietzsche, I mean, I could, I mean, obviously I can talk about Nietzsche for hours and hours. I, I love it, but, um, how do you, how do you see it? Cause it's in the, it's in the essay. How do you see how he defines culture and how does he see culture and identity as being, uh, independent and what are the four enemies of culture and how we create a, a new one? Mm. Yeah. So culture is, um, culture is this archive of exemplary achievements of human beings that then becomes the soil that will uh, make possible the future uh, great human beings. It's why he's concerned about modernity mm -hmm. because he thinks mm -hmm. that modern culture is a kind of um, uh, frenzied, atomistic mass culture. It's, it's full of mediocrity, not greatness. And he yeah. thinks that if that's the soil then the people who come after this are going to be the last man, yeah, right? Yeah, who just yeah. want to herd together uh, uh, like cattle. And um, so it's, it's essential to him that educational institutions mm -hmm. not produce what he says in one of the other essays, not mummies who, who turn their minds into just museums of artifacts, mm -hmm. Um, but into liberated individuals who know what their values are and are pursuing their values. Now, he, I, I, the way I read him is that he thinks everyone can do this. I don't read him as an elitist. Mm -hmm. I, I think he is uh, um, more Aristotelian. I think he thinks, look, everybody has the capacity to do this. Most people don't have the courage to do so. But you yeah. can. Yeah. You can um, uh, become who you are, but it will take a lot of courage and insight and it mm -hmm. will be dangerous and you will face, you know, um, you will face the dangers of loneliness and yeah. going mad by your own genius. Uh, mm -hmm. Just Schopenhauer faced these. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone does. So mm -hmm. there are these two sacraments of culture, which I, I really like that he brings out, um, which are that, you encounter some great work of art, a poem, literature, a painting, sculpture, a piece of music, and in the moment that it hits you, it awakens in you how feeble you are. Mm -hmm. So to encounter something great is also to encounter your own impoverishment. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. thinks this is a sort of first um, sacrament. But mm -hmm. then this motivates you to... Uh, you know, become something great yourself to aspire to it. Maybe you choose to become a musician. I think he has this experience when he's friends with Cosima and, and Richard Wagner. Mm -hmm. right? I think he sees, even though uh, eventually he'll, he'll, you know, disavow Wagner as well as a kind of sellout, but yeah. Yeah. initially he sees in him, wow, this amazing artist, this musician, mm -hmm. dedication and discipline a kind of father figure and mentor, a true educator in many mm -hmm. ways, right? that motivates him to make a contribution to culture. And that's, that's what he says. Our duty is to contribute to um, the uh, perfection of nature in ourselves, but also in the world. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, let me just jump in here real quick. Is, is it's, it's, so when you're saying like, you know, you, you encounter a work of art or something like that, and, and you're overwhelmed by the magnitude of it, and then you realize your own feebleness. What happens after that is what's so important because, and, and this is why he does not like this universal kind of morals or values is because if, if I, I said this before, if, if morals are, are shutting you down and not opening you up, then those are things that you have to toss, right? That's not to say that there's not limits or things like that, but it's to say that 
many times, well, that's that's too risky or or that's that, you know, that's not right or it shouldn't be that way. And it, you're, you're putting all of this shit in your head coming from these other systems that are shutting you down and not allowing. OK, well, let me actually see what arises, what comes out. And then I can decide how I want to organize or, and many times it's backwards for people. They say, well, I can't look at that or I can't see this or I can't. It's like, well, look, you, everyone's got to know their own kind of limitations of sorts, but you want to say, well, what is this telling me? Instead of trying to put a value judgment on it, right? You can do that later, but first, how do you become open to it? Right? And I think this is the best thing to do with, with art and, and, or other, other things with writing or film or, you know, different mediums of art. And so when people in that space right afterwards, if you're not doing that, that can be, um, you know, harmful, I think. So I just wanted to get that in because I think that's well, important I think too. That, that's where that piece of self-knowledge comes in because yes. if, before you have that encounter with great works of art, you don't know the trajectory of your desires mm -hmm. and what your capacities are, right? Also your limitations, right? If I, 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 like, I like cycling. Um, I'm not going to try to be a Tour de France rider. <laughs> That's not going to happen for me. I know my limitations. Um, but if you know what your values are, and that's the horizon for your life, then when you encounter a great work of art and you say, wow, uh, you know, well, some people will do this. They'll read a great novel and they say, I think I'll write a novel. Well, mm -hmm. maybe you can, right? But if you really know yourself, you may find out that that's actually not what you want. What you want is probably recognition for writing one. <laughs> but you actually want to produce one, right, right? right? And that's very different. But that kind of honest interrogation of one's desires and what one really wants, I mean, that, that kind of knowledge is a precursor to being able to make that second move into the second sacrament of culture. Yeah. Because you may encounter a great work of art, but the next move after that will be governed by what your values are in the horizon mm -hmm. that you're in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. What were so? I think you talked about the two sacraments and then the, the four enemies of culture. How, yeah, so the enemies of culture, uh, which, which I love, are the market, the state, society, and scholarship. And he finds the market. You know, uh, the market just is driven by forces that want profit. And if mm -hmm. mediocrity pays, hey, yeah, have more of it, then please. Yeah. You know, mass produce the worst possible music literature uh, uh sculpture uh and uh he thinks this is awful but the state also um you know is a difficult uh, enemy to face because it views culture as a tool for extending its power and you can think of you know propaganda and and, and that kind of thing as soon as as soon as uh any state power sees uh culture influencing people in a, in a particular direction, it's obviously going to try to seize that tool and use it for its own ends. And the third enemy is society, which views culture as a performance before an audience of one's peers. And we can just think of social media uh, there and the way that, you know, you get an Instagram account and suddenly, you know, you're an influencer and, you know, it looks like you're living this great life uh, from the perspective of, of mass culture, but you know, it's, it's not great. Um, and then the final one is, is scholarship. And, you know, anyone who reads Nietzsche will know that he hates scholars, uh, it, much like uh, Hannah Arendt did too, but she rails against professional thinkers. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But scholarship is, is just going to be this bloodless endeavor to drain the life out of every work of art. And, and, you know, I, I once saw, um, a panel with Ricky Gervais, um, um, Chris Rock, and Jerry Seinfeld, and I think Louis C.K. was on it. And they were all talking about comedy, but it was like taking the taking the curtains away and just showing all the inner mechanisms of it. And it was just <laughs> you're killing this for me, yeah. right? That's yeah. what scholarship does with great works of art, mm -hmm. right? It, it drains the life out. Mm -hmm. So he thinks we, we need to avoid those four enemies and, um, and, and produce a new culture that he thinks at uh, his time is in decline. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, again, this is uh, not to be, you know, too, too, too overly, uh, uh, <laughs> 
a positive about Nietzsche. I mean, I, I, you know, but it's one of those things where in this way, you know, anyone that's listened to us talk about Nietzsche for, for the past couple of minutes is, you know, he was, it was prophetic in a lot of ways because it was so many, it was at that time, but you can see it most certainly now and everything that happens in society and how people occupy their time and what they think about and what they watch and what they obsess over and something that really gets under my skin and something that really, really frustrates me is this just anti-culture, right? Which is just so vapid and hollow and, and, and lazy. And there's, there's, a, there's a place to be against something, right? We should be against injustices or whatever. Like, okay. But, you know, and people can have strong opinions or values or morals. That's fine. But many times there's almost like every many other things, a, a, a market and to, to make a commodity out of being anti-something. And it, it's just, a, it's a perversion of, and it's a waste of your potential creativity, your potential ingenuity, your potential, so many things. And it, it frustrates me. I mean, if, 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 you know, you know, I, obviously I'm on Twitter and, and, you know, be, I'll just see this all day. I'll see this from public intellectuals. I'll see this from people on the right, people on the left people. And it's just so frustrating because the, I know some of these people are very smart and very brilliant and, and you know they have maybe put put out good works you know papers or or essays or uh, different mediums but you know it, it's it's a way to 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 almost like a kind of catharsis publicly that's not necessary and very avoidant of trying to take the challenge of creating th things and and how how easy is it to to just be against something and not for something and I, it's hard to kind of respect uh that endeavor that people take i won't go so far as to say not respect the person but it, it does make it very difficult and very frustrating uh when seeing that in culture and in our society uh in, in many ways so i'm sure you know uh, 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 and see uh, this as well. So you don't have to speak on anything specifically, but uh, I'm sure you know what I mean. <laughs> um, okay. So we will sadly leave uh, Nietzsche. Um, I've, I've talked about him a few times here, and so I, I really, really liked uh, a lot of the points we hit there with, with Nietzsche. So we will, we will finish uh, with Hannah Arndt, uh, just as a small footnote here. Um, people that are listening to the conversation will probably pick up on this. We're just kind of moving through the chronological time frame here. We started all the way with Plato and now we're at Hannah Arndt because, you know, she was the most recent. So that's kind of the, that's kind of how your book goes. Your book kind of follows that kind of, uh, um, chronological time. So <clears throat> you've written a bunch about Hannah Arndt. Uh, we have, uh, you, you will know that I have talked to the wonderful Samantha Rose Hill about her uh, fabulous book, and she was great, and that conversation was great. Um, so um, uh, kudos to her for, for putting out some good stuff. Um, the first question I want to ask about, about Hannah is sh her main enterprise, and I, and I want to be very clear about this because I think people will misunderstand this. She defines... Um, much of her philosophy is in, in terms of the political, right? The political life, right? Is, a, is the most authentic life. So what does, because most people, when they think of politics, right? And again, philosophers, maybe, you know, political uh, theorists and stuff will maybe, you know, kind of get this, but most people will think of, you know, modern politics, right? Democrats, Republicans, the United States, you know, in, in, in whatever, you know, in the United Kingdom, in Australia and all these other places, they'll think of their like political parties and they'll think of like, you know, you know, propaganda and, you know, all the bullshit that comes with like modern day politics, right? Fine. Uh, committees, never passing bills, <laughs> right? right? All the jaded things of politics, right? And that's not quite what Hannah Arndt is up to or discussing, although I'm sure some of that's included. But so what does she mean by the political and have the political life as the authentic life? And uh, let's just start with that. And that will we'll just that will tee us up. Yeah, yeah. So um, 
political life for her is the active life in, in contradistinction to the contemplative life, which was the philosophical life. And, and her, her reading of the tradition is that philosophers had tried to make, you know, to crib on uh, Aquinas, tried to make politics the handmaid of philosophy. And in fact, that's what you find at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, right? You, um, we need politics because we need to create a stable order so that we can engage in contemplation, which is the highest uh, uh, activity that we can engage in. Um, and so uh, part of her intervention is to show how neglected the political life has been and to upset these hierarchies that philosophers have put in place. And so she doesn't consider herself to be a philosopher. In fact, she's right. quite critical of philosophers. She considers herself to be a political theorist. Mm -hmm. um, and so she wants to think about the political, about how we act with others and, um, and how we make a world with others through our shared speech and action. And so, yeah, the deliberative processes of political life, the sentence and bills and constitutions, and all, all of that is part of speech and action, mm -hmm. right? The, the communicative action of human beings trying to um, maintain plurality in a shared and common world. That's what she's concerned about. And, you know, in the 50s, there are a few lectures where she gives where she raises the question, you know, is, is politics even possible anymore? Mm -hmm. you know, um, that is, is it possible to uh, speak and act with others in a common world or, you know, has capitalism produced structures and forces that prevent that from being realized? Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, have we reached a point where we no longer are capable of speaking and acting with others? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that by definition you know politic you know the kind of the etymology of the word and things like that is you know how do people in, in, a, in a in a space or in a community how do they how do we get together and decide how we want to live life together i mean that's really where the origins of it is is and so if you just kind of map it onto like politics of today right like in theory that's what that stuff is trying to do right the whole point of having representatives and senators and is saying well what are important to us as a collective and what do we agree on of how we want to do things right and of course there's different uh, models of how to do that right uh, we have a democracy which um is a way of doing it uh it has flaws like any system um but um yeah i mean that's really what it is so so how does she believe that you know, kind of authentic human lives, right? In this political life is through speech and action. She talks about that, but speech and action with others. How does she kind of, you know, see that actualized, I guess? Well, for her, the, the basis or the source of politics is our, is human plurality. So she famously says, man doesn't inhabit the earth, men do. Mm -hmm. uh, by which she means that we are all human in the same way that none of us will ever be the same. That is the, the human, um, uh, when a human being is born, our natality, uh, and, and this is where she reverses Heidegger, where, whereas for Heidegger, we are beings towards death. For her, we're beings from birth. We're these newcomers on a stage who uh, um, are going to say something and do something, and we don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It could be good, mm -hmm. and it could be bad. Mm -hmm. um, but this plurality is um, a sort of miraculous fact of human life, that every human being is going to express and um, develop their hu humanity in a unique, yeah. irreplaceable way. Uh, and how we distinguish ourselves is through what we say and do, just like every actor on a, when they enter a stage says their lines different from what everyone else does. And without them, you don't have the play. Mm -hmm. And so for her, preserving this plurality is the goal of politics. And the, where we run into problems is where you start trying to eliminate certain people from yeah. political life and you shut down speech or you shut down types of action mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a way of imposing some kind of transcendent order on, on the chaos of, of what she would describe as, going back to Plato, the cave life. Right. The hurly-burly of civic life is 
that we get together and show ourselves in public and speak and act together. And sometimes we don't like what others say and do. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out how do we create a stable political life, a shared community mm -hmm. um, or a shared world in which everyone gets to appear. And, um, you know, her metaphor in the human condition is of a table where everyone is seated around the table. The, the shared uh, table that we all sit at also distinguishes us. We're all kept separate from each other, but at the same time joined together. And finding a political life that preserves that, she thinks, is, is, is our goal. How is that plurality connected with two other concepts she has, which is conditionality and intersubjectivity? She talks about both of them. How is that connected or, or not with this idea of plurality that she's saying? You can kind of unpack that for us. Yeah, so the, um, the conditionality is, uh, comes from the human condition, in which she says we are uh, conditioned beings who are conditioning the world. So when we speak and act in the world, uh, we are conditioning the lives that we live and, or, or live. And when we work, when we produce things, poetry, buildings, roads, um, paintings, uh, constitutions, law, when we're producing this, we're creating a world that will then condition us, just as we were discussing with Hume, uh, right? We're, we're being affected by the things that we create. And that includes technology. Right? We create technology that then begins to shape us. And this is a concern of hers, that in modern life, we're cre creating the very means for our own destruction. Both, I mean, she's concerned about the atom bomb at the time. She's concerned about technology and automation uh, and how the human being um, will no longer be able to speak and act freely. And spontaneously will be will be constrained by its own the conditions that it's created for itself. And so intersubjectivity is, she says that action is what always goes on between human beings. When I act and speak, it's always before an audience, and that's of other people. And so we don't get away from our plurality. Uh, I, I usually um, uh, explain it this way: you know, when we're born into the world. First, there had to be a plurality to even bring us into being. But when we come into the world, we're completely helpless. Mm -hmm. Our entire existence is predicated on the care of others. And without them, we don't exist. Yeah, absolutely. I think that insight uh, um, into how we are always and already situated within a world with others, that, that being with others in the world, that in, in while Heidegger acknowledged that that was part of our being in the world, he did understand it in, a, in, a, in an inauthentic way. But for Arendt, she wants to preserve that and say that is our authentic life. Um, not getting away from others, but understanding that we are always and already embedded with others in a shared world. And it matters how we speak and act with others. Yeah, well, that's, well, that's a, that's a, I'm glad you brought up Heidegger because I was going to introduce him here. Um, which is, you know, you're saying with the, the conditionality thing, which we talked about with Hume earlier, that, that people are creating a world of sorts. Now, my question is, and mostly because it makes sense to me, but also because Arndt was a student of and contemporary and sometimes lover and friend and very complex relationship of Heidegger, which is, you know, he had those types of, um, four types of world um i'm gonna forget them all but i know there's the wherein the worldhood uh, i'm forgetting the other two but but heidegger tried to understand what the different dimensions of world is so maybe using his language or not you know how does hannah's idea of we're creating a world where would that what kind of world is that that we're creating right is that this world that we Obviously, it's not a physical planet, right? It's not a physical world. We talk about the world of sports, or we talk about the world of the classroom, or whatever, right? right? What kind of world is it, is it? Would it? I guess it would fit under the wherein, right? Because that's where people are um, uh, situated in, and they're actively moving within. Or how how does she kind of mean this kind of world in which we're creating? Yeah, much in the same way. I mean, it's a shared network of of references. So she talks about it as the space between. 
it's without which we don't come together, right? Um, and it's the um, work makes the world, and the world is the stage upon which we're capable or, or makes possible action between mm -hmm. other human beings. So it is the shared referential uh, totality that we find ourselves in. And that can be language, that can be culture, um, you know, uh, but it's also the material world. I mean, she doesn't. She doesn't try to dismiss the, the material features of the world, um, buildings and roads and the way in which modern uh, cities are formatted condition us, right? Yes. And you yes. can give rise to expectations and orientations and dispositions to other people. And she's aware of all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, especially with with uh, with cities, there's a there's a scalability that happens with with cities, and and that kind of is a strange way in which that is analogous to biology, which is which is fascinating. Um, I guess I want to I want to ask one thing, and but my real question is my second one. So, <laughs> she described labor, work, and action, right? And this is kind of a popular idea that she came up with. <clears throat> so maybe just tell the 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 differences. But, but through this lens of Marx, right? Marx was a big influence on her, on her political philosophy and she had critiques of Marx on his ideas of labor. So how, how does she describe labor work and action as a response to what Marx, I guess, was trying to do or whatever? So you don't have to give us Marx political theory, but just kind of generally, <laughs> what, yeah, what, was, so, what was the, the context? Yeah, so labor for her is this external external expression of, of life. And that is not very far from Marx, right? Mm. Uh, uh, our labor power is, is what is essential to the human. It's our species being. Mm. Um, but labor is this biological process that seeks to metabolize nature uh, in order to keep the organism al alive. And so it's governed by necessity. And this is where, uh, and I, I should mention here, um, she's not um, a careful uh, reader of Marx, nor was she a careful reader of Hegel or Kant, uh, but she did read them. And I, I, when I did some archival work uh, in her personal library at Bard College, uh, I went through her copies of Capital. Uh, and she was working on this Guggenheim um, fellowship that she wanted to uh, get or to do some work on Marx, um, she was reading him. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think she was carefully reading him. Um, and, and Marx's scholars have, have criticized her take on him. But the real criticism is that he did not distinguish between labor and work because for her, work is the external expression of worldliness that we attempt to make a durable world for ourselves to shield us from um, um, nature. And there, what you have is a means ends kind of logic, that there is this kind of pragmatic attempt to achieve an end by the most efficient means. And so it's a productive activity. It's not governed by necessity, right? You could, somebody else could do the work for you. Somebody else could build your house, but you have to eat. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Somebody can't eat for you. Mm -hmm. So so in not making that distinction, and I would say that um, I'm not sure her, her critique holds for Marx. I think he he does. Uh, there are places that indicate that he's making this distinction. So I'm not sure that that's a careful critique by her. But because he doesn't, he's in seeing labor as a means to liberation. She thinks he fails because it's governed by necessity and we're never going to be free of labor. What he thinks is that eventually we'll produce these machines. They're going to free up our free time so that we can do the creative things that we want, like good Epicureans, you know, and all get a house together and paint while, you know, the machines <laughs> clean up the house and make our food for us. But uh, that's not what he says. But, right, right, right. but, um, but she thinks that is not going to bring about the kind of life uh, in which we will flourish. What we need is the political life. And this is where action comes in. Mm. Action is this external expression of each person's unique identity mm. being expressed through speech and action. And it preserves the world between us. 
mm -hmm. uh, and our plurality. And she thinks um, that this is the most, if you're going to bring about change, it's going to happen through action, mm -hmm. uh, not through work, not through labor. Mm -hmm. uh, work will be the condition for action. Um, but these are, these, I, the way I, uh, depicted in the book is a, as a kind of Mobius strip where you have these, all three of these activities interrelated sure. uh, because we have to continue to eat to be able to work and we have to work in order to be able to act. So all three of these are, are uh, interrelated. Mm, yeah, no, that's, that's, uh, that's very, very helpful. I guess the, the, the one last big topic with her that I want to kind of drill down on here uh, is twofold. <clears throat> is her ideas of human dignity and then her distinction and definition of human rights and how they're different. So just in the, the abstract way of, of you know, wh what was she thinking and up to? Wh where does this come from? So, so let me just kind of give a backdrop. So she was a refugee and she wrote this, this essay. It was called We Refugees, I think is what it was called, um, which is somewhat controversial. Right, because she was sort of, if I, I haven't read it um, in, a, in, a, in a while, but if I remember correctly, she was trying to say, maybe human rights aren't innate, right? Um, which can make a lot of people very queasy, <laughs> right? It's like, uh-oh. Um, and then obviously you can see this, I guess, and maybe in some of her her other works as well of how she... Uh, you know, Eichmann on trial and origins of totalitarianism, you can see, you know, kind of, you know, some of her pieces are kind of hyperlinked together of sorts, or obviously, uh, obviously she grows and, you know, it has changes of opinions and things. But I guess, how do we understand how she defines human dignity and human rights? And then we can kind of drill further of kind of the ins and outs of, of that and, and maybe some critiques of, of her, her opinions. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Just to answer the question kind of straightforwardly, she never gave a definition of human dignity. Okay. The beginning of the origins of totalitarianism, she says that human dignity needs a new guarantee. Mm. Uh, and this was the first uh, thing that provoked me to begin thinking about it. I thought, well, if, if she thinks it needs a new guarantee, she must have an idea of what it is. And I'll just go in search of that. And I, I could not find a single definition of human dignity. In fact, she in an appendix to the origins of totalitarianism, she says that it was one of the most pernicious myths ever perpetrated, this inborn dignity, that human beings have inborn dignity. How and is that I'm different? Not, how, sorry, how is that different? I guess, well, how, how would you, uh, how do I say how, how can we talk about something if we don't have a, if we haven't defined our terms, right? Like how to, how was she talking or meaning about well, what is dignity or what is human dignity? What, what is that? I guess. Yeah. I, I felt the same way, but she's kind of notorious for that, for, you know, creating conceptions and not giving clear, uh, it's what got her into trouble with the banality of evil. Right, right. You know, and then she later, thankfully it was because of controversy, you know, mm -hmm. clarified what she meant by that. Um, which you can read back in and say, oh, yeah, that's clearly what she meant when she was writing Eichmann. But, um, but she didn't do that with human dignity. So uh, what I did was I went through all of her lectures and her published works and her letters hunting for references to human dignity. And then I started cataloging them. And what I came up with was what she didn't think dignity was. And dignity mm, okay. for her wasn't something inborn and essential. And so uh, because she didn't define it, I set out to try to develop a theory of dignity that I thought um, fit with the way she was using the term. Mm. And for me, it seemed that she was jettisoning any metaphysical or pre-political or super political notions of dignity. It wasn't going to be a soul. It's not a natural a feature of the human being. It's not reason. Um, it's not something that God bestows on human beings. It's, it seemed to be, to me, confined to the political for her. And so what I did was I looked at the way dignity had been talked about as a status of human beings, that they're the greatest beings in all of nature because they're the pinnacle of nature. They have the most dignity or a status of an individual, this particularist notion of dignity that because I've uh, achieved some kind of virtue or 
excellence that I'm acknowledged for my dignity. And this is kind of the pre-modern notion of dignity, that dignity is bestowed when someone does something great or excellent. Um, but for Arendt, she conducted this kind of quasi-phenomenological analysis of dignity, in my view, mm -hmm. by looking at the way the term had been used. And when I did, so I, I set out to try to do that. And what I came up with was that the root of status and, and um, uh, stature was stance, that it has to do with standing. And that seemed to me the political origins of the notion of dignity that we began talking about dignity in the modern period when we realized that, uh, and, and you will only find talk of dignity, maybe beginning in the, uh, there's some references in, in uh, Cicero and then later in the Renaissance, but it's really a modern notion after, the, after World War II. And so um, we realized how fragile human dignity was after the war. That if, if it had been natural and everybody knew that you had dignity, you would, it would be the object of respect, but it clearly wasn't, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you could dismiss the dignity of others fairly easily uh, and violate their rights. And this is the point about human rights for her. She rejected the uh, notion of the Declaration of the Rights of Man, that there was some kind of natural endowment of rights. She sided with Edmund Burke, who said, rights are bestowed by communities, political communities. Those are basically civic rights that we uh, bestow upon citizens, um, but they're not natural. And she said, if they were natural, they would have protected people, but they didn't. And so I tried to reconceive human dignity as a political concept and understood it as conditional dignity, that it de was dependent on political action, meaning Human dignity had to be asserted by its bearer, and it had to be recognized by the community. And that recognition is the um, recognition that the bearer of the dignity has a right to have rights, uh, which is another uh, term that she deployed in the origins of totalitarianism, but never fully explained or defined. So it's created a lot of different interpretations. Mm -hmm. And um, one interpretation of that just a kind of very narrow interpretation, which is the one I kind of followed in, in the first book, was that it's bestowed by a political community, that it is the right to belong to a community. And that's the way she talks about it. Um, and in belonging to a community, you have a right to be recognized as a person who is a bearer of dignity and deserving of respect. The broader way that uh, people like Sheila Benaby uh, um, interpret the right to have rights is that it is a moral claim. This is not something that aren't uh, um, developed, but it's something that I, I think um, is necessary if she wants to maintain that we have something like a right to have rights. There has to be a more uh, moral um, basis for the right so that it has normative force. Otherwise, you just have a claim uh, uh, by an individual with no reason for why it should be recognized. Right? And that doesn't seem what she wanted to do. She wanted to find a guarantee for human dignity, which seems like she wants something to have more normative force. But Sheila Minabib is right to say, um, you know, Arendt undermines her own project there. She wants to have a protection for human dignity, but she's also is such an existentialist that she doesn't want to have any kind of metaphysical ground for dignity. And so there I've kind of moved away from this position of, of a, con, a conditional dignity that is strictly political. I think there is a conditional dignity, but it, it has a, a more um, moral uh, basis, which is rooted in personhood. And, and I'm, what I'm looking for now, which I haven't fully developed, uh, is, is, a, is an idea of imminent normativity for personhood uh, that, isn't, that is rooted in the notion of being a person and, and what it means to be a person um, uh, that grounds normative claims for respect and recognition. Um, and I think 
um, that's that's what I want to develop. I, I, I haven't gotten there yet, but that's that's the trajectory. Okay, there's <laughs> many many things there. I have I want to ask. So, if we Okay, let's start with norms. <clears throat> uh, I like norms. You like norms? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, I think a close approximation of something that we can say is normative for us as humans is rooted in natural selection in our evolutionary makeup. At the end of the day, we are infusing now that that may be justified and that may be okay right but we are infusing something onto maybe the the transcendental <laughs> idealism right of kant we're, we're trying to tr infuse something about us as 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 humans but our evolutionary nature doesn't know that necessarily at, at, at its at its uh basic foundation, right? Our genes, uh, our biology, we're trying to find the best versions of us to replicate and go to the next generation. That's our, our at a base level as, as a norm. We can agree on that in our evolutionary framework. And in fact, all of life on earth is trying to do that down to single cell organisms and all the way up to complex multicellular organisms like ourselves. I think most people agree with this. It, it, there's nothing, it, it seems, um, at that, so that's one basic level, right? Obviously through evolutionary time, we have a higher, highly evolved brain and we are social mammals. And so because of those things, right? Uh, there, I mean, other animals have, you know, highly evolved brains too, but as far as we know, in the way in which we have abstraction, executive functioning, the use of language, et cetera, other uh, mammals and other animals don't have that. Doesn't necessarily make us better, uh, just different. We, are able to understand, uh, and, and in some ways, the, the ways in which we're social, ways in which we need to coexist together. Does that mean that this dignity, um, this idea that uh, just for being human, or just for being an individual on the planet, means you are required to have this right or this dignity. Um, probably not. If evolution doesn't know that, it doesn't know that you need that. It's, it's just trying. Now, we're not just evolution, right? So that's what I'm saying. In terms of evolutionary time, at our social network and how we cooperate, that has also evolved, right? So I'm just saying as a base foundation, we probably don't have that. But as we've scaled out, I guess you could say, from uh, Homo erectus to Homo sapiens to where we're at now, you know, 1.3 million years later, in, in time, we have all of these things, right? We have these things that we know, you know, kin selection, reciprocity, cooperation, you know, interdependence, uh, uh, status, et cetera, all of these things that we have evolved as highly in intelligent and highly complex social males. So, is it possible that rooted in that, if all of those things are a type of norm that at, at base capacity, all humans can do, or, or they, they have the potential, I guess, to do that. How can we build from outside of that, a norm that says there is dignity somewhere within that? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I, I or is it always going to be this external piece? My last point here, the moral impetus here, the moral shift, my first question is, is, well, you know, whose morals, right? 
whose morals is that? You know, I mean, there's a million moral values that are out there for people from different histories, from different cultures, from, from different origins. And, and we can't universally and normatively, I think, say that. I think you could find enough, I don't want to say some, I think you could find enough uh, uh, variants from that morality that would not make it normative, that would not allow it to be transcendent across all humans, all 8 billion of us on the planet, past, present, and then future. So that seems to be tricky unless I'm understanding the morals wrong. So my, my first thought is, well, how do we instantiate it within the evolved nature of how we are as, as social mammals and as humans? So that's, that's kind of my first thought. So go ahead and give me yeah, your thoughts. One, so one um, intervention that's been made in this direction that I've really uh, uh, been influenced by and am persuaded by is uh, Martin Hagelin's uh, book, This Life. Um, and there he says, um, in knowing that I want to persist, right? As you've pointed out, I want to persist in being, this is an insight from Spinoza, right? I want to persist in being, but I also know simultaneously that I'm going to die, uh -huh. and I don't know when. Right. So I, my my mortality, my finitude, means that there is a finite time that I don't know what the extent of it is, but it's a finite amount of time that I have to live. And during that time, it matters how I'm treated and how I spend my time. So there, there's a kind of existential awareness that is a norm for me. Right. But now I when I look at you, I also know that you are like me. You're going to die and you are also finite. And it matters to you how you spend your time and how you're treated. And so now I'm tied in this plurality with you, two finite beings who care about how they spend their time and how they're treated. And we seem to have some imminent norms there about reciprocity and recognition and cooperation that are normative for both of us in spite of our particularities. Uh, and I think that intervention into moral and social and political philosophy that Hagelin has made opens up the possibility of developing uh, an account of imminent normativity that could suggest uh, a way of rethinking dignity and grounding rights in a moral way. So it's moral in the sense that I'm making a claim on you about how to treat me during the time I have, and you're also making a claim on me. Um, and so thinking about those is going to be, a, a we'd have to give a moral account of those. And so I think, you, and, and it's moral because there are values associated there, a value that I have for my life, a value that I have for my time. Yes, I, 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 I'm <clears throat> agreeing with the general trajectory of it. I think that there are people that don't value their life. Now, and they might not care about how they spend their time. Now, are those anomalies? Maybe. Is, is the majority of humans going to care about how they spend their time and how, you know, that they don't want to die and they want to live a fruitful life? Probably. So you can't always just say, well, what are the outliers? I mean, I think that's, that's you, you can have norms and you still have outliers, obviously. <clears throat> well, even the suicidal person, though, uh -huh. cares about their, uh, about their life and how they spend their time and how they're treated. They don't like the way yes, yes, that's is. Fair. That's the reason they're suicidal, because that's they fair. do care. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. Uh, I guess, mm, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe expand a little bit uh, this idea of moral kind of standard because I, I, I get very uh, kind of like I said in the beginning you know, who's morals you know is it static I don't think so how does it evolve I, I get kind of uh, critical about a kind of normative morals because my first thing is I just I just have more questions so how are you kind of understanding or taking a kind of moral standard for understanding dignity and, 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 and rights well this is why I, I I want to talk about imminent norms rather than transcendent or even transcendental norms. Okay. They have to be imminent to our lived 
experience and they have to be part of our shared experience because uh, and so if, if there's a morality to be had that can be normative at all, it's going to be it's going to have to be normative to our experience. Now, uh, I mean, I've, I've sketched out a little bit you, making use of Hagelin of how that might happen, but we can also think of, say, um, uh, Jan Bernstein's book on uh, on torture and dignity, where he talks about moral injury. A moral injury, uh, if we take that as a starting point instead of transcendent norms of saying it's wrong when you do this, but rather recognizing that when someone's life is interrupted through through some kind of moral in injury, they can't spend their time as they would like to spend their time. They can't live as they'd like to live, whether that's because of economic practices or oppression or racism or you know poverty. This prevents them from fully actualizing themselves as human beings. And so there's a way in which we can get imminent moral norms out of our shared experience and our uh, experience of moral injury. That it, there does seem to be a way that we would all agree, look, when something is fragile and can be lost, it's valuable precisely because it can be lost and it's, and it's fragile. But how can we... Okay, but how can we how can we have the imminent norms when everyone's experience is going to be different? So how can we how can we what's the variance there, right? Or <laughs> what's the confidence interval here? <laughs> where where is that? Because how can we have a a a, a norm of a, of a experience that someone has lived? How how can we what what what's the what's the how wide is that be, umbrella? They'd have to be a shared experience, right? That we're all going to die, for example. Everyone okay. should have that okay. experience. Okay. And moral injury, right? We, we all don't want our bodies violated and tortured. Uh, we don't want to starve to death, right? We, we don't want to be beaten, you know, without okay. cause. This kind of, I, I think there are some shared um, experiences of being human that cash out as or can cash out as as moral norms and they would be imminent to our experience and to our shared experience and there you could have at least not some kind of uh um uh explicit moral code but a basic uh set of norms for um for human existence okay 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 i I, I definitely understand it, and I I I like the idea. I, I would have to like chew on it a lot more, but I, I I like the idea. I guess let me just maybe end with a or or, or you know this piece with a, maybe an example. So um, let's take the the crisis in Syria, right? They have a terrible civil war. They've had a terrible civil war. It's going on a decade now. I think it's awful. Um. And there's a lot of what, what, what many people would say is innocent life. And I think that's right, is people that don't want a part of this and their, you know, houses are being blown up. They're, you know, they're being, you know, killed in the most grotesque ways, et cetera. And, you know, <clears throat> um, and so when <laughs> this, let's follow, you know, art on this, right? When there are so many uh, what we call refugees leaving that country because of what you would say, these imminent norms of their humanity is being uh, um, uh, impaired, I guess you could say. It is a way of the, where they're being um, infiltrated in a way where they can't live any way that they want or whatever. And they go to other countries. How, how do we deal with this problem? Because whose responsibility, I guess, is that, right? If they can't, it's a strange concept, right? Because it really has to do with space and worldhood, really, right? Is if they can't live in the country, let's say, that they're born into or, you know, whatever, and they want to go somewhere else, but we're talking about millions of people. How does, how does that get solved? How does the political, right? The political life, right? How do, how do, as a community, how do people solve that? 
how do we deal with something like that? Because it is a, we talk about human rights, right? We talk about, you know, injustices. How, how would we, with a, with a type of norms kind of thing, how do we then make this uh, pragmatic of how we, we deal with it kind of at a, at a bigger scale or bigger, bigger level, you think? I mean, I think international law is the way uh, that we need to do that. I mean, and, and this is, I think, what Arendt envisioned when she wanted to find a, a guarantee for human dignity, this international shared responsibility for human dignity and human rights. And we, we haven't gotten there, but we have done a lot of uh, um, deliberative uh, judicial work in creating uh, a system of international law and courts. Not everyone is signed on to that, so it's not, yeah. uh, but it, it does seem to be the way, but the law has to, uh, to be effective, has to codify and institutionalize those imminent norms, mm -hmm. right? That, that would be the sort of track. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, of course, you're you're working with nations who are concerned about power and sovereignty, and and you have to negotiate that, right? And that's where things get really dicey. Um, and and this is where you know Hannah Arendt was skeptical about whether or not we could preserve human dignity because um, uh, she knew that it's a predicament of common responsibility, and not every nation, and certainly not every person, wants to assume that responsibility. Yeah, and and then that yeah, I mean that just becomes really really complicated, and and I I share some of that skepticism. I mean it's it, there's I, for as many people that want to do that or want to figure that out, there's enough people that don't really care to figure that out. Which is well, there's a the psychology to that, of, of of course. So yeah, um, <clears throat> well, look, John, this has been uh, this has been so much fun. Um, I I've I've uh, really enjoyed the the many hours we've spent talking about so much uh, wonderful stuff i feel uh my my <laughs> my mind and and my heart is very content at the moment right so it's very 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 wonderful to talk with you about all these things um your your most recent book which is brilliant it is a nice very nice very helpful uh and necessary accessible overview of many uh ideas and philosophers within philosophy uh, it's a continental guide to philosophy. Uh, where can people uh, find this and where can people find you and all of your other uh, work? Yeah, you can uh, get the book from Edinburgh University Press. Uh, it's also available on Amazon if, if that's your thing. And um, it, yeah, you can find me at uh, johndouglasmacready.com. Great, that's wonderful. Again, John, this is uh, this is so much fun. I'm I'm so uh, ever thankful for <laughs> your time, your energy, your stamina, uh, your brilliance. Um, it was uh, everything I wanted and more. And so uh, this was was so so much fun. And so I big 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 thanks to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Xavier. I really enjoyed it. All right, thank you, thank you.